The following is a special presentation of ABC Sports. Around the world, race drivers dream of having their names etched on the Borg Warner Trophy as champions of the Indianapolis 500. The idea began 80 years ago, a model racetrack carved out of Indiana farmland. The dream of Carl Fisher of the ultimate proving ground for the 23-year-old automobile industry. The vision became reality, a two and a half mile rectangle paved with brick, destined for history. But history would prove the Speedway could give and take away. Louis Meyer back home again in victory lane in Indiana. No one has ever won it three times before. Louis Meyer sliding, sliding down to the wall. The car out of control. Louis out of the car on the track. We may have seen his last lap at Indiana. Victory at the Speedway can convey the supreme exhilaration. And he knows he's won. A long day coming to an end. We're looking at the 1938 winner of the Indiana 500, Floyd Roberts. But from those same people, the Speedway can demand the ultimate price. Bob Swanson out of control. Floyd Roberts becoming involved in the accident. Out of the arena. Floyd Roberts over the wall. There's fire on the track. We have, and there's Jeff Miller, but Roberts is out of sight. In the 500-mile race, some men accomplish what for others is impossible. A.J. Floyd will win his third Indianapolis 500, a great comeback after last year's disappointing season for him. And there's an accident in the front straightaway. <laughs> two, three, four cars. Where's Point? I don't know whether he can get through or not. He's only got a couple hundred yards to go, but where is he? There he is! He's running him through. A.J. Foyt will win the Indianapolis 500 in an incredible, thrilling finish. It is at the Speedway that destinies are determined in the wink of an eye. He may do it. Yeah, he may. He's at post. Look at that. Shallow, shallow. Come on. They're going to get the All right drive. Right. There'll be one left All to right. go. Indianapolis 500, however, is not just men and machines or winning and losing. It is a stage of human emotion, the great victories, the great defeats. It is truly a human spectacle, a spectacle of speed. The quest for speed has unquestionable danger. It also has incomparable rewards. A year of planning and a lifetime of preparation comes to an end as 33 teams wait for the green flag. Since 1911, 580 men and one woman have started the afternoon drive to glory. 143 have led, only 52 have won. Today, the vision of a single man has grown to the dreams of thousands, the Indianapolis 500 mile race. Today, May 28, 1989, it's the greatest spectacle in racing, the 73rd running of the Indianapolis 500-mile race. Well, race fans began lining up last night outside this, the world's largest stadium. At 5 o'clock this morning, the aerial bombs went off and the gates were thrown open under a Clear, clear, crisp, blue Indiana sky, a nice brisk breeze blows across the grounds, and the fans are now streaming into their seats. It's expected that by the time the green flag waves, there will be nearly half a million people here to view the Indianapolis 500.
Hello, I'm Paul Page, and it's just 7.47 minutes away now until the start of the engines. And we're standing right on the main straightaway where it's just electric with excitement here as people prepare for the 500-mile race. Fans, crews, crowds, everyone here ready for the 73rd running. Now, there's a good deal ahead of us today, a great deal of promise. For example, Al Unser Jr., A.J. Foyt, four-time winners. Will they possibly be a five-time winner before this day is over? And Rick Mears, the defending champion, well, he has three wins to his credit. Will he join the four-time winners? Emerson Fittipaldi, two-time world driving champion, will he become the fourth former world driving champion to win at the Indianapolis 500-mile race? And then, of course, there's Al Unser Jr. He's never won on an oval. Will this be his first oval win and his first 500-mile race victory? And then, looking further down the field, there's Danny Sullivan. He drives with a broken arm in the 500-mile race. Will he score his second 500 win? So much promise to look forward to yet today. There are other stories, too. Let's go to my colleague in the pits, Jack Aru. Paul, one of the determining factors as to who wins and loses this race may be these tires. Now, crews will have a choice of two compounds throughout the course of the event, and they may be switching back and forth based upon how the car handles. Now, the tires are radials for the second year in a row, and some of them have developed a vibration, so we'll be staying on top of that story as well. Now, if you change tires, you'll be doing it on pit road. And for more on the pit strategy, here's Brian Hammonds. Jack, when work begins here on pit road, it will be more important than ever for these guys, the pit crew, to do their job as quickly as possible. With the speeds they'll be running here today, every second that is lost in the pits translates to over 100 yards lost on the racetrack. These guys could win or lose the Indianapolis 500. Now let's go to Dr. Jerry Punch. Well, Brian, among the many recent improvements here to the Brickyard, none have been heralded more than the resurfacing of pit road. The old rippled and wrinkled concrete is gone. That has been replaced by a smooth, silky stream of asphalt. Now, Paul Page, many of the drivers agree that although the approach speeds will be considerably quicker, the increased visibility and improved car contact with the surface should make pit road that much safer for everyone involved. Thanks, Jerry. The cars are now lined up on the home stretch, silent for the moment, but very soon they will roar into life. Let's take a look at the 11 rows of three that will stream toward the green flag. On the pole, the defending champion, a three-time winner, Rick Mears, broke his own one and four lap records here two weeks ago in qualifying. He is the first man at Indianapolis to hold the pole five different times. Alongside Al Unser, a four-time winner, he turns 50 tomorrow. Away from the track, he enjoys snowmobiling in Chama, New Mexico. The outside is Emerson Fittipaldi, a two-time world driving champion from Brazil. Now he lives in Miami, and he loves speed on land and on sea. The second row on the inside is Scotsman Jim Crawford in a car that he wrecked 10 days ago. He's still in physical therapy from an 87 crash. The center, Mario Andretti, his 23rd 500, but only one win. Could this be his day? He loves anything mechanical. Scott Brayton is a bachelor. He once held the track record here. He runs a cement business in Coldwater, Michigan. Inside row three is Bobby Rahal, the 86 winner and a two-time national champion, father of Michaela, Jared, and Robert. Allenzer Jr. starts in the center. In demand by the press, he is even occasionally interviewed by his wife, Shelley. Brazilian Raul Boisel starts outside for his fourth Indy 500. He is an accomplished show horse jumper. Row four on the inside is four-time winner A.J. Foyt in his 32nd race. Horses or horsepower, A.J. loves racing. Randy Lewis is in his third 500. He holds a marketing degree and is a connoisseur of California wines. John Andretti started racing in midgets. He is the son of Mario Andretti's twin brother, Aldo. The fifth row, Teo Fabi, the 1983 rookie pole sitter here is from Milan, Italy, where he prefers family life with his wife, Gloria. Gary Bettenhausen's father raced here. Gary is a versatile driver. He lives on a farm a few miles from the speedway. Dutchman Ari Leyendijk is the 85 Rookie of the Year. He stays fit for driving by swimming and working out daily. In the sixth row is Carol Palmroth, the Finland, rookie Scott Pruitt, and Ludwig Heimrath, Jr. The seventh row on the inside is rookie Didier Tays of Belgium. He has been steadily gaining open wheel experience. He's a former ARS champion. 
Another rookie, Mexico's Bernard Jourdain, is in the center of the row. He plays soccer to keep in shape. And Michael Andretti, Mario's son, starts outside row seven. He and his son, Marco, spend time away from the track watching hockey. Row eight, Tom Sneva, the 83 winner. Two-time winner, Gordon John Cock and Irishman, Derek Daly. In the ninth row, John Jones is the fastest rookie in the 500 field. He's a former IMSA champion in GTO. He comes from Thunder Bay, Ontario, Canada. Danny Sullivan is the 85 winner. He drives with a cast on his right arm from his accident in practice here two weeks ago. Kevin Kogan is on the outside of row nine. Twice he's finished second. He lives on the edge of the California desert. The 10th row, Rocky Moran in an A.J. Foyt car. Dominic Dobson and Billy Bukovic, grandson of the two-time winner. And the 11th row, Davy Jones, veteran Poncho Carter, and Rich Vogler, a USAC midget and sprint champion. 33 of the finest drivers in the world ready for the green flag. And the starting field has a record average speed of 216 and a half miles an hour. The giant oval that is the Indianapolis Motor Speedway is the seconds tick away. And right in the center of the oval is the garage area, the old gasoline alley. While most of the cars and crews are on the straightaway, in the garage area, some of the drivers still wait for the start of the race. This is Al Unser Jr. A few last words with his crew before they are ready to go out to the line. They try to stay isolated until the last possible second. On the track itself, the clock continues to count. We'll be back. Back live at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway with 37 minutes now to the start of the engines. These are corporate VIP suites off of the fourth turn at the Speedway. Suite one belongs to Roger Penske. Inside, plenty of fun this morning as they prepare for the 500. People in this suite, like uh, former baseball commissioner Peter Uberoff, enjoying the race from here. Earlier this morning, we were, at the invitation of Rick Mears, able to follow the pole sitter as he began his day. He stays over at the Speedway Motel, which is on the ground here at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. He was able to sleep fairly late this morning. He's an old hand at this. His wife, Chris, picked up breakfast for both she and Rick. Brought it to the room very early on. And then it wasn't too long thereafter until they both began the uh, trip, really only about a quarter of a mile from the Speedway Motel over to the start finish line in the garage area. Rick Mears was ready for his long day. Now, let's go to the garage area in Jackaroot. Chris Mears, they say that a wife probably knows the mood of her husband better than anyone. What is the mood of Rick this morning? He's a little more quiet than usual, and I also noticed that he didn't really have much of an appetite. He usually eats a pretty good breakfast, and this morning he just kind of played with his food instead of eating it. Now, we're only 35 minutes away from the command to start engines. What's going through your mind? I'm nervous. I'm really nervous, but uh, once I get on the timing stand and have to do all, you know, my job of timing and scoring, then my mind just stays focused on that, and I don't have to think about anything else, and that really helps me. I'm, I'll be okay once the race starts. Paul, she's definitely looking for the green flag. All right, so Rick Mears and Chris ready for the 500-mile race. Here on the straightaway, they've begun to warm the engines. It's the last time they'll roar until we're ready to go racing. Now, driving the pace car today is our colleague, three-time Indianapolis 500-mile race champion, Bobby Unser. Then you'll join us in the broadcast booth. But the first laps of the 500, what do you expect? Well, the big story of the year here at Indianapolis, of course, is the pavement, Paul, and it's raised the speeds like about five miles an hour around the racetrack. So we're going to have a fast race. Aside from that, what I see is, is the, on the front row, the three Penske TC-18s that are Rick Mears, my brother Al, and Emerson Fittipaldi, they're going to be awesomely fast. I think what you're going to see is the rabbit and the hound type thing early on with Rick Mears being the rabbit, Big Al being the hound, and don't ever forget, Emerson Fittipaldi is going to be figured in also. Yeah, I think you really have to watch Fittipaldi on the first lap. Now, most of the cars left are Lola chassis. What about them? The Lolas, you can't count out at all. Number one, you better look at Michael Andretti, Mario Andretti, and Al Unser Jr. And right behind them, the guy's going to keep them on it, so it's going to be Bobby Rahal, and he will do it. I think today we're going to see the fastest, best race we've ever seen in Indianapolis, Paul. 
All right, so Bobby Unzer will be joining us with the coverage here at the track today. Now, we'll be doing coverage from that broadcast booth high atop the paddock grandstand overlooking the home stretch. And up there is our other broadcast colleague, Sam Posey. Well, the view is great, and the uh, wind is beginning to die down, which is good. Paul, I think we have all felt that this race could be a crossroads in Indy history. If Al Unser wins, he will have, as you said, five wins. A.J. Foyt will have four, and Rick Mears will seem really kind of far behind with just three. But if Rick wins and has four and ties it up, then I think the momentum really shifts to him. He's only 37 years old, and it's easy to see that in the next few years he might win two or even three more races and become the unrivaled all-time Indy champion. It's certainly possible. You know, Rick and Al are very similar in their approach to racing, but I think in their approach to the race today, there may be a subtle difference. Rick is going to try to win this race, and Al has got to try to beat him. Well, there are just 33 minutes to go now before the signal to uh, start the engines. Al and Rick, of course, both drive for the Penske team, which at times seems to have the best of everything. And earlier this week, Bobby and I took a look at two other key components of the Penske organization. This is the Penske Indy car known as the PC-18. PC stands very simply for Penske cars. Roger Penske seeking the advantage, the special edge that he looks for in business, in fact, in everything he does, decided years ago to build his own cars here in this factory in England. However expensive it might be, however much effort it might take, he would have what no one else could have. That is his style. The cars were good. Indy winners, national championship winners, until three years ago when the factory rolled out its only real lemon, the PC-16. Penske reacted swiftly, firing the designer and hiring this man, Nigel Bennett, who just happened to be the designer for Penske's biggest indie rival, Lola. Some designers are innovators. Others, like Bennett, are men whose genius is for attention to detail and for recombining existing elements to produce a car that seems to wind up faster than the sum of its parts. Bennett's meticulous approach was fine with Penske. He works that way himself. It was no surprise that Bennett's first car for Penske, the PC-17, was evolutionary, not revolutionary. A development of Bennett's successful cars for Lola. Driven to victory at Indy by Rick Mears and to the national championship by Danny Sullivan, the new Penske was an unqualified success. And it was not only a great car, it was a great car that only Penske could have. The 17 was followed this year by the PC-18, another of Nigel Bennett's evolutionary design. A few pounds lighter, a fraction lower, a trifle thinner, slightly slicker aerodynamically, it is, like all Bennett creations, very fast and very beautiful. Rick Mears has won his third Indianapolis 500, and Chevrolet has won at Indy. Just as Pinsky sought a special edge in the chassis department, it was natural for him to want an engine that gave him an advantage also. For years, everyone, including Pinsky, ran the British-built Cosworth. It was very reliable, very powerful, and relatively cheap, and available to anyone who wanted one. And that was just the problem with the Cosworth, because in Pinsky's mind, anyone could have it, and that he didn't like. Then along came Mario Elian, a Swiss engineer with a proposition for Penske to build an engine similar to the Cosworth, only incorporating all the latest developments in design technology. Again, this was to Penske's taste. Nothing radical, just something that would dominate. It's totally computerized, 40 pounds lighter, yet creates more horsepower, and over the last year has become the dominating force in the IndyCar field. Like the Bennett design Penske chassis, the Chevrolet V8 was a great success and at one Indy in only its third try. Unlike the Penske chassis, however, the engine would have to be shared, but only with six teams, much to the disappointment and aggravation of the rest. For Penske, even sharing with a limited amount of teams may be too much. Does that mean that Roger may someday look for another engine? One that he can call his own? Well, we'll just wait and see. The Chevy engine, definitely a dominating power. These are the teams that hold those engines. Most experts feel that the win of the 500-mile race will come from one of these teams because of that engine. The skyline of the city of Indianapolis. You know, 
The race is really a three-week affair in the middle of the month of May. Jack Aroot reviews the month at Indy. There have been many moments this month of May, like Rick Mears unprecedented fifth pole position with his Penske PC-18. Harrowing moments like last week's crash by Jim Crawford. After putting his car on the inside of row two, Crawford crashed, crimping a Cinderella month of May for the amicable Scott. Nostalgic and yet sad moments such as this. Three-time 500 winner Johnny Rutherford bumped from the field in the last 10 minutes of qualifying, then taking the reins of fellow Texan A.J. Foyt's backup car and beating the 6 o'clock qualifying deadline, only to have his engine explode after a lap of over 217 miles per hour. But the man of the moment throughout the month has been Danny Sullivan. A freak crash during practice left the 85 winner with a concussion and a broken right forearm. While his team prepared a backup mount, Danny went under the knife to get ready for the race. Doctors took bone from his elbow, combined it with a steel plate, and fashioned a brace to withstand the rigors of Indy. Sullivan's moment came eight days ago when he was put to the test. A qualifying run of over 216 earned him a spot in the race and left the team much relieved, if but just for the moment. But the many moments of May are pale in comparison to the moments of today, the 73rd rendition of the Indianapolis 500. Well, the speculating is over. The question to Danny Sullivan is, is, can your right arm take 800 left turns? Well, we hope so. Dr. Trammell just came in and kind of redid it and put all the sensors and everything on because I got a little electric uh, shock going to it uh, out of a TENS unit. He said it would last two and a half hours or 500 miles, whichever came first. So uh, we're going to go give it our best shot. There have been some modifications to your steering wheel. What's been done there? Well, we shaved down the right side to make it a little thinner so I could get my hand in there with the brace and get it around the steering wheel. We put a ramp on it uh, so that I had something to push against. And then we angled the steering wheel a little bit more upright so I didn't have to bend my wrist at all to get around it. Roger Penske is confident that Danny can go the distance. There is no relief driver standing by here today. Paul? About 26 minutes to the start of the engines now. A last chance for the race fans here to move back to the gift shop and buy their last minute souvenirs before the start of the race. We'll be back. Back live at Indianapolis, about 23 minutes to the start of the engine. The pole sitter, the defending champion, Rick Mears, heading out to the, to the pit area. And Danny Sullivan hitchhikes on there. Al Unser. Could he be a five-time winner before this day is over? Very, very possible. He starts the center of the front row. The car is sitting on the straightaway. And among those is the race car of Gary Bettenhausen as they prepare for their 500-mile race. Many great families are here, the Unzers, the Andrettis, and, of course, the Bettenhausens. Now, they're a brave clan. They're still living the legacy of Indianapolis. In the 1950s, the Indianapolis 500 was contested by a generation of drivers to whom courage meant more than technique. Races were won not so much by technology as by sheer force of personality. It was a time when post-war America looked for heroes and found some of them behind the wheel. One such man was Tony Bettenhausen. Of German descent, he had four children, a daughter, and three sons the oldest of which, Gary, was a teenager when his father was in his prime. Gary remembers his dad. He was the type of guy that after he'd win a race, or even if he blew up on the first lap, he would sit there until there was not a fan that didn't want it, I mean, the, until everybody was gone. If there was somebody that wanted his autograph, he'd stay until dark. And I think that's why he was so popular. May 1961. In his 13 starts, Tony had often led the 500, but had never won. At the age of 44, he knew he didn't have many chances left, and winning Indy had become an obsession. He called me at noon, and how he had some brake shoes being worked on for one of the tractors or the combine or something, and he asked me to call and see if they were ready. That was noon, and 10 minutes after 2, Jack Beckley called me, and he was gone. He had been killed, not in his own car, but testing a car for a friend. He did not succeed at winning Indy, and he left that legacy to his children to hopefully do what he wasn't able to do. 
and uh, I think I remember the, when I first started that we all had it in our mind that we'd win the first one for Tony and then the second ones would be for ourselves. So it was just something that uh, we wanted to do for him. Tony's death was to be a harbinger of frustration and misfortune. Gary would lead the 500, be on his way to victory and the fulfillment of his father's dream when just 17 laps from the end, his car coasted to a stop. Then Merle crashed at Michigan. His right arm, trapped between the car and the wall, was torn off. Then this, Syracuse, New York, a sprint car crash in which Gary's left arm was paralyzed. For about, uh, I'd say, the first three days after the accident, uh, I laid in the hospital and I thought, uh, there's got to be a better way to make a living. You know, what does this family have to do to realize that there's a better way than automobile racing? Year after year, Gary and his brother Tony came back to Indy, always with the obsession, never with the tools to win. They were fighting a tide of technology and big money. The values their father stood for no longer won races. Family pride became mixed with bitterness and frustration. The most important thing in my dad's life was winning in Indianapolis. And he never did, and he ended up dying there. And it went on to me, and it's my most important thing in my life. I think, without a doubt, we've given too much, and uh, it's almost too late to quit now. I mean, you got to keep going for what we're, we've been trying to do for so many years, and we're running out of time. I realize that I'm in the twilight of my career. There's Tony, and that's it. Tony doesn't have any boys. My two boys will never drive. So we're not running out. Gary Bentonhausen, will the dream come true today? He now begins to move toward his race car, supported by his brother Merle. The rest of the family begins, along with the crew, to gather Kroos to give some moral support. As they walk past Peter DePaulo's Dusenberg and out into the pit area, it's now just 18 minutes to the start of the engines. We'll be back. at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway where we are just counting down the final moments before the command to start engines. And the mood here has changed on pit road as this crowd of over 400,000 people begins to be separated from the crews and the drivers as they begin to focus in on the task at hand. Looking at the crowd, they are ready to be entertained. And the drivers are ready to do just that. A little bit different than in years past here. But now is when we begin to count it down in earnest. Now is when the greatest spectacle in racing takes on a whole new importance. For those that are new to the Speedway, it's something that's indescribable. And to start it off, the Purdue Band and the National Anthem, which will be sung by Mr. Tom Hudnut.
Return to the start to finish line as the combined U.S. Armed Forces Color Guard stands at attention. Here is John Totten for our next introduction. Now, ladies and gentlemen, our invocation today from the Most Reverend Edward T. O'Meara, Archbishop of the Catholic Archdiocese of Indianapolis. It is race weekend once again. It is also God's weekend. It is our country's memorial weekend. There are tens of thousands of us together this morning in this stadium. We are from every state and from many countries of the world. In the way our conscience tells us let each of us pause to offer worship and praise. We thank you, God, for the blessedness of being human. We are sisters and brothers to each other. Help us respect each other and treat each other gently without violence. Make our world more peaceful, God. Make us restless until our hostages are free to move about, to live their lives in freedom, and to gather as we do today. Help us be mindful of those who have died for our country from its beginning in 1776 to the sailors who perished so recently on the battleship Iowa. Have them all in the hollow of your hand. Bless those who have suffered unfinished deaths in the service of our country and are the survivors of conflict, wounded in body and spirit. Ease their pain and help them to know that all of their fellow Americans are grateful to them. It's race day, too. Watch over our 33 skillful and courageous drivers their mechanics, and their crews. And one thing more, dear God, help all of us to enjoy the day, return us safely to our homes and work, and continue to bless us with this glorious sunshine. Amen. Now, Jim Philippi. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, will you please remain standing? On this Memorial Day weekend, we pause here in a moment of silence to pay homage to those individuals who have given their lives unselfishly and unafraid to make it possible for us to witness as free men the world's greatest sporting event. We also pay homage to those men who have given their lives unselfishly and without fear to make racing the world's most spectacular spectator sport. Dave Calabro for this introduction. Race fans, another fine tradition here at the Indy 500. It's time for the annual singing of Back Home Again in Indiana. It is my privilege to introduce to you the man who sings it oh so well, Mr. Jim Neighbors. Back 
Jim Neighbors, and the Sea of Balloons, and the Purdue University Band leaves the start-finish line. And we turn our attention now to the head of the starting field and waiting for those magic words. This final moment of anticipation, Danny Sullivan sits ready in his machine, position 26 places back. Mary Fendrick Holman, ready to give the command to start engines. As the formal ceremony, ladies and gentlemen, to an end. we are at that time of the day for the command that will start the 73rd running of this event. And here, to give the traditional four words is Chairman Emeritus of the Indianapolis Motor Speedway Board, Mrs. Mary Fendrick Hallman. sitter now so completely isolated with his own thoughts alone for this moment alone for the next three hours Mario Andretti will this be a second win for him he has tried so hard and for so long Al Unser will this be a possible fifth win today there is so much promise in the running of the 500 miles so much that these drivers might anticipate Jim Crawford the Buick power behind him as the crews, a final handshake, a flip of the engine over 25,000 horsepower, roar out their challenge in the main straightaway now. And in just a few seconds, the field will begin to pull away. The crews raise a hand to indicate that their engine has started, that they are ready to run the 500 miles at Indianapolis. The grand champion, A.J. Boyd, the most victories ever in the Indy car. Michael. He's won at other tracks. He's never won here. Could this be his day to carry on his family's legacy? And Danny Sullivan. What must be going through this man's mind? A fractured right arm on the hand that grips the wheel so tightly at this moment. Straight away cleared with the exception of the cars and their starting crews. And now the field begins to roll away. 
the 11 rows of three. Bobby Unzer is in the pace car with perhaps the best view at all, Bobby. Yes, it is, Pa. The people are standing. Everybody's waving. I can't see an empty seat in the house. The track is clean. There's no paper on it. It's a beautiful track. We're taking off now at about 40 miles an hour. Let the guys get their transmission oil warmed up, their engines oiled up. The crowd is just cheering so loud, I can hardly hear myself. Bobby Unzer works through the south chute. There's a shot of Bobby. Bobby, you'll pick the pace up to about how fast by the time we get going. Well, as soon as all the cars get started, we'll be running to run about 80 miles an hour. We want to stay enough ahead of the front row where they don't get any spark plugs fouled. We want to make sure that the road is clear, make sure that there's no debris, water, or fuel, or oil, or anything like that on the racetrack, Paul. So Bobby Unzer in the pace car works his way through the first turn right now. You can see the corporate suites. One car still having problems, and now he fires and moves away as the entire field is ready to go. Scott Brayton faltered for a moment. No, here is a car with a problem. The 33 car. Rocky that, of course, Moran. belongs to Rocky Moran. Let's take a look at this starting field. One last opportunity to review how the rows line up. The first row, of course, Mears, Unser, Fittipaldi, all with a great deal of promise. The second row, Jim Crawford, Mario Andretti, Scott Brayton, the third row. Bobby Rahal, Al Unser Jr., Raul Boisel from Brazil. The fourth row, A.J. Foyt, Randy Lewis, John Andretti. The fifth row, Teo Fabi with the Porsche Power, Gary Bettenhausen, Ari Leyendijk of Holland. The sixth row, Finland's Carol Palmrock, rookie Scott Pruitt and Ludwig Heimrath Jr. Didier Taze and Bernard Jourdain, both rookies in the seventh row, along with veteran Michael Andretti. The eighth row, two two winners of the race, Tom Sneva. Gordon Johncock and Irishman Derek Daly to the outside. The ninth row, the fastest rookie in the field, John Jones, of course, Danny Sullivan, and Kevin Kogan. The tenth row, Rocky Moran, if he can make it into a starting position, Dominic Dobson, and Bill Vukovic, the third. And the final row, Davy Jones, Poncho Carter, and USAC, and USAC Sprint, and midget champion Rich Vogler. Danny Sullivan works his way around the track. Let's get an update on his physical condition. Here's Gary Pike. Well, Paul, 17 days ago, Danny Sullivan was lying on an operating room table in nearby Methodist Hospital, his shattered right forearm being pieced together by this steel plate and these metal bolts. Now, Sullivan has been cleared to drive, but he must wear a specific special splint that will limit the use of his right arm. Now, what he can do, he can extend his hand at the wrist just a couple of degrees to grasp the wheel. What he cannot do is rotate his right forearm in or out. That may create a problem as he tries to make his way onto and off of pit road. Now, just moments ago as he climbed in the car, I was privileged to a conversation between him and his orthopedist, Terry Trammell. He asked Trammell one question, very simply, what can I expect? Trammell's response was one word, pain. He said as the afternoon progresses, that right forearm will begin to swell inside the split. It will begin to throb and pulsate. The pain could become almost unbearable. No one, not even Danny Sullivan, knows if he can tolerate the torment. All those questions and many more will be answered a little over three hours from now to the second flag fall. All right, so we'll be watching for Danny Sullivan. Michael Andretti, car number six, one of the other cars, will be keeping an eye on today as he starts back in the 21st starting position. Very difficult to tell his car from his father's, but Michael has the black number six on his car. And Gary Bettenhausen, with his problems already beginning, he has begun to slow and rolls to a stop on the home stretch. The field has begun now the second of the two parade laps, but Bettenhausen with a problem. He does not appear to be under power, and he appears to be rolling to a stop. His crew will perhaps be able to come out and get him restarted. That's just a matter of conjecture at this moment. Gary Bettenhausen stopped. The, the nice bright white car with the red number five that belongs to Mario Andretti as he works his way now beginning to surge forward on the back stretch checking the gauges for a final time AJ Foyt four time winner the familiar number 14 a solid black car here today with AJ Foyt orange green orange trim on the machine AJ works his way around could he be a five time winner well there are AJ fans here that think that's very very possible the front row weaves back and forth. That yellow car, number four, that belongs to the pole sitter, Rick Mears. And then two closely identical cars belong to Al Unser and to Emerson Fittipaldi, number 25 and number 20. Well, Bobby Unser, as you work the field around now, how's that race course look? 
Bobby Unser, how's the race course? Paul, Paul, right now I'm watching all these people cheering and going on. I wish I was in a PC-18 on the front row starting this race. It would make this Pontiac seem slow, but this is a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful thing to see today. The rest of the field strung out behind the pace car. Let's go to the pits, Brian Hammonds. Paul, because of the way they qualify here in Indianapolis, there's an interesting mix of cars and drivers at the back of the pack, specifically rows six, seven, and eight. There are several drivers with very little or no experience at all here in Indianapolis, but there are also two very fast cars driven by two of the hardest chargers in racing, Michael Andretti and Tom Sneva. So when the green flag flies, everyone will have to be very careful or the first two corners could be a real adventure. Paul, back to you. Well, Brian Hammonds, there is, of course, some concern about this car, the 99 machine that belongs to Gary Bentonhausen. The crew went out onto the straightaway and retrieved it. They have quite a push to get it back to his actual pit area where they can first apply the tools to it and start to get it in performing order and hopefully into this field. Brian Hammonds makes the point about the difficulty in the back of the pack. You know, most of the drivers will have planned exactly what they're going to do in the first couple of turns, and sometimes that planning can be an obstacle if things begin to develop that are unexpected, an accident begins to develop. Incidentally, some practice speeds uh, from three days ago when the cars last ran on this track. Al Unser was fastest at 217. Remember, this was in race trim, not in qualifying trim. Mario Andretti was second fastest. Rick Mears third fastest. And Crawford, who, of course, is starting from the second row, was quite slow. So it's quite a volatile situation even at the front, Paul. The pace car begins to accelerate, as does the field. The field up in the north end of the track. We look back from Bobby Rahal's car as they begin now to stream toward the green flag. The pace car is off the track. The field running down toward the green. A line now, and the green flag flies, and we're racing at Indianapolis as the front row heads for the first turn side by side, and Emerson Fittipaldi sweeps from the outside across the front of Rick Mears and Al Hunter, and Emerson Fittipaldi takes the lead. Begins to develop. Incidentally, some practice speeds uh, from three days ago when the cars last ran on this track. Al Unser was fastest at 217. Remember, this was in race trim, not in qualifying trim. Mario Andretti was second fastest. Rick Mears third fastest. And Crawford, who, of course, is starting from the second row, was quite slow. So it's quite a volatile situation even at the front, Paul. The pace car begins to accelerate, as does the field. The field up in the north end of the track. We look back from Bobby Rahal's car as they begin now to stream toward the green flag the pace car is off the track the field running down toward the green a line now and the green flag flies and we're racing at Indianapolis as the front row heads for the first turn side by side and Emerson Fittipaldi sweeps from the outside across the front of Rick Mears and Al Hunter and Emerson Fittipaldi takes the lead in the first corner across the short shoot the rest of the field comes safely through the Indianapolis 500 the 73rd running is underway Emerson Fittipaldi is leading aerial bombs fire off overhead indicating the position of the cars on the track as Fittipaldi all Already up into the third turn, and Emerson Fittipaldi coming across the short shift and streaming toward the start finish line. Emerson Fittipaldi off a of number four, and look already what a tremendous distance he's stretched out as two time world driving champion Emerson Fittipaldi, the Patrick Racing entry across the line, followed by Rick Mears and Alan Dr. Sr. What a superb start, Paul. That is the cleanest start from the front of the grid. We're already looking back significantly along the track to find Rick Mears, who is running in second place in front of this enormous crowd. Mears clearing the uh, turn two there, and you see the other two cars right behind him, Paul. So it's Emerson Fittipaldi out in front. This is second, third, and fourth. That's Rick Mears, Al Unser, and Mario Andretti has moved up into fourth place. Al Unser Jr. into fifth right now as the Indianapolis 500 is now underway and running safely. And look at there, that is Emerson Fittipaldi. Look at the tremendous distance he's already put on the second place car of Rick Mears. Now the fight begins for third as Al Unser tries to hold off a charging Mario Andretti. The fight is for third place. The second lap run at 213.7 miles an hour. So already a torrid pace being set here at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. There is every anticipation that a new record speed is going to be set today. As Bobby Unser said, the track... Oh, 
Almost a move by Mario there. The track has been repaved. It is very, very fast. Temperatures are cool. The wind has ceased to be a factor. We could be in for a very fast day here. Well, Mario continues to worry. Al Unser Sr. in a battle for third place. The leader is still Emerson Fittipaldi. And now Mario comes to the inside. Can Mario get past? He does. Mario Andretti forces his way past Al Unser. Two great veterans, both with a great deal at stake here, taking up the battle early in the going. It doesn't surprise me a bit that Mario... And an accident, an accident. The 11 car, that's Kevin Kogan, up on its side in the pit area. A serious accident in the pit area, but look at Kogan. The car cut in half. The car in half, but Kevin Kogan climbs out. This accident occurring up at the head of the pit area. The crews are there, no fire. And once again, a tribute to the safety of these cars, Kevin Kogan climbs out of his broken and split machine. A tremendous impact against the wall coming off of four. The yellow flag flies. There's debris on the main stretch. What a star-crossed man at this speedway is Kevin Kogan. We think back, of course, we look now at the end of the pit lane wall, which we believe he may have hit. That's why the car was broken in half, much as Dennis Firestone's was years before. Here he is. You can see the scrapes on the side of his helmet as the car slid sideways. Kevin Kogan being tended to by the medical experts here. There is the car, the engine disconnected as they watch and protect for fire. That's actually up in the north end of the pits. Now here is the situation. Let's just watch. Coming off of the fourth turn. Kogan taps the outside wall. The inside wall and then the end of the pit wall. Now there is an attenuated barrier right there at the end of the pit wall. There is also an ABC Sports camera right at the end of that pit wall. The field now very, very slow behind the pace car. Here is that camera at the end of the pit wall. You see Kogan sliding. He comes down. Now watch. Kevin Kogan impacts the end of that attenuated barrier, which absorbed a great deal of the injury in energy in that impact. So we are under yellow at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway with four laps complete. The leader is Emerson Fittipaldi. We'll be back with more coverage of the Indianapolis 500 after this message and a word from our ABC stations. I should get back to why he's smart lost here. Yep. All right. Yep. Scoring, ladies, if you can keep down a bit, it will help us when uh, there's action there. I know it's difficult. Just try and be uh, Judy's, Judy's super. Judy, two. Stay as far back as you can, except when you need to look. <laughs> Judy, one. Judy, two. Yes. Yes. He's high off the corner, Sam. Yep. <laughs> I s yep. Show it to me one more time. Show it to me one more time. Is that him there? Right here? Okay. Okay, I'm, 
I, I, I'm trying to do it. The machine, I'm having trouble with the machine. Yeah, I'll have to. Kogan, lost it, get here, then here. Cut the camera. Yes, go ahead. This is Bobby. One, two, three, four, five. This is Bobby. We're back live at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway, the 73rd running of the Indianapolis 500, and the pit is jammed with emergency crews right now, cleaning up the debris caused when Kevin Kogan lost control, coming off of the fourth turn, hit the outside wall, the inside wall, and then the end of the pit barrier. Now, there is the car, Sam Posey. You can see that he was high coming through turn four, Paul. High, slightly out of the groove, and right there, he impacts the wall and starts toward the inside of the track. Spinning backwards, this may have saved his life, that he hit backwards when he hit really hard for the first time. Now, of course, he impacts the end of the pit wall. And now, sliding across to the inside of the pit wall, the newly resurfaced pit lane there. You see him coming to a rest. I said he was star-crossed here as we look at another uh, angle of the same thing from our camera that was located in the end of that pit wall. And I say was because I believe it is now uh, out of commission. Kevin, of course, crashed here just after the start in 1982 when he was driving for Roger Penske. That triggered an incredible controversy in which his career never really did recover. He almost won the race in 1986, was beaten only at the restart by Bobby, uh, Bobby Rahal with just uh, two laps to go. It's funny that all of the events of fate that have affected Kevin Kogan here at the Speedway have happened right on this exact part of the track. All right, let's get an update, Brian Hammonds. And we're with Andy Kanapinski, the team manager for Kevin Kogan. Uh, have you been in contact with him? Is he okay? Yes, I have. I just talked to him while he was sitting on pit row here. He's fine, he's coherent, and he's talk, complaining about a, a small uh, neck uh, pain. Uh, they've uh, put a neck brace on him, put him on the board and taken him to the hospital just for observation. But he's alert and doesn't seem to have anything broken. Uh, Did he say what happened? Well, my observer up in uh, turn four, we have one up high by radio communications, Phil Roth, uh, told me he was coming high out of four, hit the wall and spun, and backed it into the guardrail uh, at the pit entrance, hit her pretty hard. The good news is Kevin Kogan seems to be okay. Paul? So Kevin Kogan takes a trip to the track medical center, but he appears to be all right. Six laps are now complete at the Indy 500. Emerson Fittipaldi leads, and we run under yellow. I'm going to go for Benton We're back live at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. We're under yellow. The pits are still closed. There's the reason why. They're continuing to pick up little parts, pieces of debris as a result of Kevin Kogan's accident. Uh, his life most certainly saved by the safety designs in the car and the attenuated barrier that allows itself to collapse at the end of that pit wall. On board with Michael Andretti, who so far in this race has had a pretty good run. He started 21st. He is now up to 13th, and he did that in two green flag laps. We now have eight laps into the record book. And Emerson Fittipaldi is out in front, but of course running under yellow. Ahead, you can see the rest of the field that lies just ahead, the 12 cars ahead of Michael Andretti. Of course, we had talked about high record speeds. Uh, that is uh, not possible when the field is running under the yellow. If the race becomes one filled with incident, then of course, the focus shifts to the pit crews. Pit work is always very important here. You see, uh, see Gary Bettenhausen now being pushed back into the garage. He had started from the middle of the fifth row, his best opportunity for years. That Bettenhausen obsession, that long time saga continues, certainly without a resolution today. So as Gary Bettenhausen, terribly disappointed, heads back to the pit. Once an IndyCar is taken behind the pit wall, the day is complete. They can't do repairs in the garage area and bring that car back out. It's ironic, isn't it, Paul? Look at how calm everything looks, these cars virtually parading by. This in contrast to the savage severity of that accident to Kevin Kogan. I saw him there, incidentally, with his wife, Tracy, so I know she knows he's okay. 
All right, now throughout this race, we're going to use a number of different racing terms, and we've prepared a little glossary to help you understand them. Here are simple terms that express much more complex ideas. For example, we may say a car is pushing. Push or understeer is the tendency of the car to continue straight after the wheels are turned. The best example of push came last year with Danny Sullivan. Watch his hands. As he turned, the car went straight, and he pushed into the wall. The opposite of push is loose or oversteer, when the back end of the car tries to slide out once the wheels are turned. Last year, Scott Brayton got loose. The back end swerved out. He overcorrected, fought the car, and lost to the loose condition. We also refer to the stagger setting. Stagger is making the right rear tire slightly larger in diameter than the left rear. It helps the car turn left easier because the right rear is driving the car into the corner. The short shoots are straights that link between the first and second and the third and fourth turns. In the race, we'll refer to the move-over flag. The starter will display this flag to advise a driver another car is following closely. Sometimes a driver will be black flagged. That means report to your pit, where a race official will either check your car for safety or reprimand you for a violation. The Indianapolis 500 is 200 times around the two and a half mile track. Lightly banked with two 5 8 mile long straights, it is lightning fast. Bobby Unser takes us for a tour. Okay, Paul, we'll start by going right down the front straightaway, across the start and finish line, and into turn one, pulling over three Gs of side force. Drifting out right to the short shoot wall, going into turn two, again pulling three Gs of side force. Very important how fast we get off of that turn to get down the back straightaway the fastest that you can. Nothing to obstruct your vision down here, but the driver will get over real close to the wall going into turn three, Diving right down to the white line again and literally drifting right out to the north short shoot wall and into turn four. Important again how fast we come off of this turn because they're going to run approximately 230 miles an hour down the front straightaway. The racetrack is smooth as glass right to the start finish line. But not at speed at the moment. At the moment it's behind the pace car. Bobby Unser no longer involved in the driving of the pace car. Don Bailey now has the wheel and will take it around on any opportunity that there is a caution flag. Here is on board with Michael Andretti. Now remember, he started 21st. This is back at the start of the race. And maybe we'll get an idea as we watch this at how Michael was able to thread his way up through the pack to position number 13. That's the Porsche Teo Fabi that lies just ahead of Michael. As he works his way into turn three, gets around the Porsche, and now sets sight a little further up. Well, you can watch how everybody is buying for the other guy, trying to figure out where the other guy is going to be, and that's exactly what Michael is doing. Sometimes he's going by the right-hand side of the car, sometimes on the left-hand side of the car ahead of him. The biggest problem is, is those guys in front right now, because of all the traffic, can't be looking back at Michael. They have to worry about what's in front of them, and Michael knows this. Now, something I'm sure you were watching, Sam Posey, there is a rule here now that says you can't continuously drive with all four wheels under that white line. Michael did it on two corners there. That's going to be a close call by officials when they have to decide that. Yes, it is. So we're under yellow at the Indianapolis 500-mile race, the 73rd running. Emerson Fittipaldi is still out in front of the field after Kevin Kogan's accident. We'll be back. We're back at Indianapolis Motor Speedway. I'm Dr. Jerry Punch, and we're standing with Dr. Henry Bach outside the Hannah Emergency Medical Center. And Henry, you've just checked over Kevin Cogan. How is he? Uh, Kevin Cogan was brought in here after his track incident. He was awake and alert. He's complaining of some neck pain and some right arm pain. Uh, we're going to send him down to the Methodist Trauma Center for further evaluation and treatment. Henry, you were able to see the accident on those monitors in there. You, probably like many of us, couldn't believe that uh, he would be able to walk in as well as he did. I guess we've seen it before, Jerry, and it continues to amaze us, but we're very pleased that it comes out this way. Another tribute to the safety equipment on these cars. Let's go up pit road to Jackaroo. Jack? Jerry, it's a very quiet gasoline alley for Gary Bettenhausen. Gary, this was supposed to be your year, and you're out. What happened? Uh, we don't know something I think the cam broke or something was just the first gear warming up and uh, all of a sudden the engine went pop bang and I quit running and 
your feelings, though? You know, you, you really had pointed towards this one and felt that this was the best shot you've had since probably mid-1970. How do you feel now? Truthfully, I can't say it on air. <laughs> Disappointed, you know, like, I really felt I had a chance to run right up in the front today and uh, with a little luck maybe even win the race because it's a 220 mile hour race car you said it before when we did the the story on the bettenhausens you don't know how many more years this family can give to this place any thoughts now about that i have to start counting days again <laughs> seems like a long time till next year Well, it's the 35th year that a Bettenhausen has been in the 500 field. Gary Bettenhausen now looks ahead to year 36. Let's go back again on videotape and take a look on board Michael Andretti's car as he approaches the accident scene. Debris all over the race course. Look at that, down to the left. Pieces of Kevin Kogan's broken race car strewn all across the track. There's a wheel to the right. You can see them working down in the pit area. It's a very, very devastating crash. A lot of parts on the track. Now, let's go over to Brian Hammonds. Paul, I'm very pleased to have the Vice President of the United States here with me, Dan Quayle. And Mr. Vice President, you've been to this race so many times, but I understand it took some schedule juggling to make it this year. It did take some juggling in the schedule. I was not uh, scheduled to come here, and all of a sudden I said, look it, I always go to the Indianapolis 500-mile race. There were some uh, concerns about the security, but we got everything worked out, and we're delighted to be here. I can't, couldn't imagine missing uh, the fir my first race of uh, Indianapolis as vice president, I didn't. You said you've seen this race over 20 times. Have you picked up any favorite drivers over the years? Well, you go back uh, over the years of uh, Parnelli, Jones, of course, Mario Andretti, and A.J. Foyt have been here for a long time. You now got the Penske cars. They dominate the front row. Uh, you watch those cars, but uh, it could be a very interesting race as it usually is. Who's your choice here today? I don't have a favorite choice. It will take somebody very special, very uh, skillful to beat that front row. Mr. Vice President, it's been a pleasure. Enjoy the rest of the race. Thank you very much. Paul, let's go back to you. All right, Dan Quayle. I bet he's got a little better seats this year, though, Sam, than he would in the past. But you know, he said it would take a lot to beat that front row. How about superstitions? Do you realize that number four, which is Rick Mears' number, has never won a race in a year, ending except one ending in zero? And do you realize that no one has won from the middle of the front row since Mario did it in 69? That might put Al out. And how about Emerson? His problem is he's got too many letters in his name, believe it or not. Donald Davidson, the great historian out here, pointed out that in the last 20 years or so, you have to have a short name like Mears or Foyt or Unser to win this thing. Well, the field works its way down the home stretch again, completing lap number 14. All but 12 of those laps have been run under caution, 12 under caution, and two under green. Now it's on the 15th lap as the leader comes across the line. Vittipaldi is still the leader of the race. He has led in three different 500-mile races, and they are now reporting that Kevin Kogan will, in fact, be taken to Indianapolis Methodist Hospital, where he will be examined to make sure that uh, everything is okay. The medical center here, while it's very, very good for immediate trauma, is uh, better used uh, only for the immediate situation. Let's take a look at this accident again, because it puts me in mind of 1964, when Dave McDonald, in a very similar spin, crashed against the inside wall, burst into flame, but didn't have the advantage of being caught by the outside wall and went into the path of Eddie Sachs. It took both of their lives. Look how much better the safety is today. Now the field begins to accelerate as they come toward the fourth turn. The pace car high on the track dives into the pit area and Emerson Fittipaldi leads them back to the green flag. They fly down the main stretch. There comes Mario trying to the inside, and Mario picks up second place. Rick Mears drops back just a bit. Mario Andretti, no question about it, has been so overlooked, Paul and Bobby, this month. That may have worked for him. He was not a contender for the poll. There was not much focus on the Mario-Michael father-son relationship, surprisingly. It was all deflected by the attention to Danny Sullivan and his arm and Rick Mears uh, getting the poll. So, I think the Andrettis have kept to themselves all month. They planned very carefully for this moment, and it seems to be that things are going well for this team. They certainly did. You can watch, Sam, that Mario knew the green flag was going to come out. They're stored at 
Gambo, and I think Gambo saw what was happening behind him, with Rick and Mario possibly trying to get a little run at him. So he crowded up close to the pace car. In fact, they were all passing the pace car before it even got into the pits. And that's really a good old USAC uh, sprint car start, what that is. But nonetheless, Mario did get by in the second place. The 20 car Emerson Fittipaldi is running in the lead of the Indianapolis 500 mile race. We'll update a couple of drivers for you. Rocky Moran was finally able to take advantage of that yellow and get underway. Remember, he had trouble starting his car when the command was given as well. So Rocky Moran, after eight laps under yellow, was able to get into the Indianapolis 500. And Jim Crawford, who started in fourth position, dropped back a little bit and is now running in eighth place at the front of the field. It's still Emerson Fittipaldi, now file, followed by Mario and Ready. Rick Mears is running in third place. Al Unser Jr. is up in fourth, and his father is running in fifth. What you see right now, Paul, is that some of the cars are separating a little bit. There seems to be a distance between, for example, Hamill, Mario, and then to Rick. And the reason for this is it's very early in the race. The racetrack, as far as being slippery, is just still a little tiny bit slippery. The guys don't want to run in the turbulent air for a little while until they can kind of feel each other out. Other than the pass that we saw from Mario, that's about it for right now. Well, Danny Sullivan is playing it very careful. He has that broken right arm. You're on board with Bobby Rahal right now as he works his way around the speedway. Rahal, you know, once told me that emotion is the enemy of the race driver. You try to keep your emotions in check, but you know, on a beautiful day like this with a giant crowd like this, if your car is running well and Bobby's is running well, it's hard not to feel a sense of exhilaration. Bobby, you've been out front. That's looking out the looking back. back. Yeah, you've been out front in this race. Did you feel a, a layer of emotion entering into what you were doing? Sam, I was talking to Ray Hall down at the starting line just before the race started, and he's the coolest catch you ever saw. He was describing how he came here his rookie year. He walked out through the garage area, looked at this crowd, and said, oh my gosh, would you just look at all of this? He says, I didn't even know if I should be here. Now here is a car into the pits. That's the 91 car, Gordon Johncock. And the way he wheeled it in and the way the crew is approaching it, it looks like he may also be done for the day, Bobby Unser. That has to be turned on. It looks like it's something in the engine department because it definitely just shut it down totally. No enthusiasm. So it was definitely terminal, Paul. Now, Bobby, something we're going to have to keep track of as we watch them take the back calling off of Gordon Johncock's car, two-time winner at the 500, is the, uh, is the situation with this white line rule where they can't run continuously under the white line. What's your understanding of the situation? It's very vague, and it's another judgment type of call. Uh, I felt that it should either be a rule or not a rule not good to do it that way. So the drivers know that they can do it. For example, as long as they're trying to pass somebody or using it for safety. Now on a driver's viewpoint, that's gonna be any time he wants to do it because that would be his argument. The problem with it, of course, is, is if USAC decides to do it, they can zap them like a stop and go penalty, which could in fact cost them the race. The rule is just too big, though. Already now 21 laps of the 200 are complete here at the Indianapolis 500, and Emerson Fittipaldi begins to approach slower cars in the field, working his way through the first turn. He's a great two-time world champion. He really knows how to work his way around this race course, but like all people, he's subject to nerves. We ask him how he handles his nervousness. Uh, with the years of experience I managed, to, I, I'm able to sleep. Um, if I find some place where I can lay down and sleep, I, I love to do that. And I think that's a way to, uh, to take all this pressure from like a balloon that you build up a pressure and it's there. And then this balloon starts, pressure starts going down. And, and I'm able to, uh, with doctors I check, I, I'm able to get my heartbeat nearly my normal before the race starts. I can be down to, I would say, 65 uh, beats per minute just a few minutes before the race starts. And I think that's when I'm feeling really great. Emerson Fittipaldi leads on the backstretch. Slower cars just in front. Didier Taze, he comes around him, comes to the inside now. And the rhythm that he keeps here is going to be critically important to him to make sure that he can get around the course and time his passes without actually getting involved with a battle with one of those slower cars. 
Rhythm is important, but sheer speed has become very much a factor. Emerson turned a lap two laps ago when he was in the clear of over 218 miles an hour, which is faster than anyone went that Thursday when they last ran. As they say in horse racing, this track is playing fast right and now. Emerson has become quite an over-track racer. He comes to the road circuits, he comes to Formula One. And Sam, Sam uh, Emerson Fittipaldi has certainly broken into being a good over-track racer. Well, if there was a question about Danny Sullivan's right arm, it should be going away at least for the moment. Danny Sullivan, who started 26, has now moved up 11 positions and runs in 15th place. On board with your nephew, Alan Sir Jr. Well, you can see all the dirt that comes up from the other cars. That's the first thing we see on the camera. That's all debris from the racetrack. Shows you that as clean as this racetrack is, it doesn't get completely clean. There he's going to the left, three abreast, going right down the front straightaway with Al Jr. And picked up third place from Rick Mears as he did so. So little Al moves into third as Rick falls a little further back in the field. Shades perhaps of last year. Is there a handling problem there? Or is this Rick's strategy? Just stay in touch with the lead. Well, when you speak of last year and we see little Al pull out to pass Didier Tace, he's laughing Tace there. But the point is that last year and there's uh, boy, Rick Mears not taking this uh, pass uh, easily. Uh, last year, at this point in the race, uh, Rick Mears was almost a lap back already. Uh, here's Fabi in the pits. That Dale Fabi, the Porsche, has a problem. He slowed on the race course after moving up to 12. And Gordon Johncock is out of his car and out of the race. Let's go to Brian. Gordy, what was it to put you out of the race? Uh, evidently, something happened to the engine going down the back straightaway. It just blew up. It's a hot, sunny day. What are the track conditions like? Well, the track conditions are real good. They've never been better. Gordon Johncock, two-time winner, done today. Paul? Gordy Johncock has not finished a 500-mile race here since he won. And that close finish with Rick Mears back in 82. And look at Rick Mears as Al Unser comes past Rick Mears and picks up a position as well. And Bobby Rahal is right in there, too. Rahal is really pushing it right now. You see him in the center of the screen. This is a great battle, of course. Each of these men has won the Indy 500, and one thing about having won this race is once you've tasted that, Rick you Mears want to tries win it Ray even Hall more. to the inside. Mears ducks under that line, tries to get Bobby Ray Hall, can't do it. Now, Sam, or Paul, that's the white line blue deal that we're talking about. That it's okay. There's Rick running all four wheels under the white line, trying to pass Ray Hall. Now, that's totally legal to do today, so the folks can watch as the race goes on. If There's a patented the Rick Pierce attempt as he takes it almost to the grass on the backstretch and gets around Ray Hall again. Now, what that is, that's brute horsepower. That's a Chevrolet against the Cosworth. Now, Ray Hall has the new short stroke Cosworth in there with two of them in the race, Lion Dyke and Ray Hall. His, obviously, his Ray Hall is running very good, but not as good as Rick Pierce because Rick just outpowered him. Ray Hall now runs in sixth place. Rick Mears was able to get up to fifth. Here is Danny Sullivan and Emerson Fittipaldi coming to overhaul Sullivan, and Sullivan now goes one lap behind the leader. Now, the reason he can go by on the straightaway like that, Paul, is just because Emerson's getting through the turn better. Danny's arm obviously isn't working as good as it does when it hasn't been broken. So he doesn't go through the corners quite as fast, but therefore straightaway speed goes slower and Emmo just passed him right down the straightaway. All right, so Emerson Fittipaldi is out in front of the Indianapolis 500. We're seeing some great battles in the top six as we continue here from Indianapolis. We'll be back. We're back live at the Indianapolis 500. A tremendous fight for fifth place as that's Allinger Jr. on the outside and Michael Andretti comes to Allinger Sr. on the outside. Michael Andretti comes to the inside. They've been battling along with Bobby Rahal in that fight as well as Michael who started back 21st. Threads his way up through this field and doing an incredible job. Michael Andretti may be the second fastest runner on this track right now next to Emerson Fittipaldi. There you see Alex Sr. on the left of the screen, closely pursued by Bobby Ray On board with Bobby Ray Hall. Interesting thing about Alex Sr., he told me that one problem with not racing often, as we know he races only in the 500 milers, it is, wow, he's headed into the pits there. This is not a pass strictly on the track. It is that it's hard to get yourself up for running in, in uh, traffic. And yet he's done absolutely beautifully today. Watch him come fast down this new smoother pit lane. You can judge your braking distances much more accurately than you could in the old days. So Big Al comes into the pits. He started in the front 
row, the center of the front row. The Penske team goes to work on that car, and as they, there's a shot from our, our pit cam. It's actually mounted on the right front wheel changer's helmet as he comes around the car, and Al goes into the action. Here is the leader, Emerson Fittipaldi, and Jack Arruda is there. Emerson Fittipaldi's Pat Patrick-led crew has gone to work. Now, they're going to go to the harder tire that we alluded to because the temperatures have gone up since qualifying. All the lead teams that have come in on this pit stop sequence already have elected to go with the harder tire. They have, now, Fittipaldi almost stalls the engine, but he rekindles it, and he's back out on the racetrack. Under the green flag, Emerson Fittipaldi goes back into the action. Rick Mears has also made a stop and moved back into the fight. On board with Bobby Rahal now as he stops. Well, you could, there's little Al just leaving right now, Paul. He's been and had his stop. Everything's under the green flag so far. We've got a car in front of the pit. We've got a car sideways in the pit. You got a glimpse of it right there. As we are making stops, that's the 70 car. That, of course, belongs to John Andretti. As he got sideways in the pit area, and the crew went out to give him a hand and get him back into place. What happens there, Paul, is that not a problem with the pit lane, it's a problem that somebody is leaving when somebody else is coming in. And John Andretti's particular case, he just got caught in a bad position right there. Now, Bobby, there was some concern. This is a newly repaved pit area here as well. They've covered over the old concrete with asphalt, and they've made it very, very smooth. But some people thought, well, maybe it's going to be a little too fast. Now we're on board with Michael, but the answer to that, Paul, is it won't be too fast. It's all going to be. There's Michael coming into the pits now. Watch how smooth it is. This will give us an example of what we're talking about. The tires are staying on the ground now, so they can actually stop a lot better than they could when they were bouncing in the past year. They keep the engine revving about 5,000 RPM while it stops. And then they put it up to about 9,000 to pull away. Now that's Mario. That's Mario Andretti, two very closely resembling cars. They're, they're teammates, of course. Mario, you can tell the difference because he has the, uh, the red number five and the, uh, and the, right, the red dot on the nose. Now here is Michael as he leaves the pits after that stop. So it's Mario Andretti and Michael, both members of the team that make the stop. Now the rules are when they leave the pits, they have to stay down on the apron until exiting off a turn two. And there's Michael. He drifted over the line of the short shoot, that's no problem. Now he's up the middle of the racetrack, working his way over the right-hand side, full speed now. So Michael Andretti, under the green flag, works his way around the Indianapolis Motor Speedway, running in fourth place. The leader is still being scored as Emerson Fittipaldi. We'll be right back. We're back live at the Indianapolis 500. 40 laps or 100 miles of the 500 mile distance are now complete. There are the top five continuing to be led by Emerson Fittipaldi after the first pit stops. There we go, looking at six through 10. Nice little battle developing right at sixth place right now. Then Lion Dyke, Ray Hall, Bozell, Jim Crawford round off the top 10. There's Teresa Fittipaldi, her husband, leading the Indianapolis 500. The whole Fittipaldi family is here. They've had a great week, but they're sure quiet at the moment as Emerson Fittipaldi, for the fourth time in his life, leads the Indianapolis 500. The number two car belongs to Al Unser Jr. He has been part of an ongoing fight that has revolved around third, fourth, fifth, sixth place. The race started with Emerson Fittipaldi jumping into the lead, and then two laps later, it was Kevin Kogan slamming the wall, bringing out the yellow for almost 18 laps. And then when they went back green again, Emerson began to steadily pull away. The fight developed behind him. Let's go to the pits. Jack Aroot. Well, this is Jack Aroot down on pit road, and there is a problem that has befallen Danny Sullivan and Team Penske. They came in for a regularly scheduled pit stop just about four laps ago. They changed tires, and they checked with him and asked him how his arm was feeling. He didn't even mention it. But they have brought the car back here onto pit road, and they are concentrating on the rear, and it looks as if they may have possibly had a problem with the rear end, maybe the ring and pinion gears. Sullivan has killed the engine. He is consulting with his crew right now. He has lifted the visor. And this will 
certainly put him out of the running to score his second Indianapolis 500 ball page. Danny Sullivan with a terribly long stop as we continue to watch this fight between little Al and Rick Mears. Bobby, you know there's something in the pit. Yes, I did, Paul. I just watched them. Another sorrow thing for the Porsche people. I just watched them push their car back into the garage area. So they've obviously dropped out with a mechanical failure of some sort. We continue to watch as Rick Mears works his way around the track trying to hold off a charging Allinger Jr. Now to the backstretch, Allinger Jr. trying to take fourth away from Rick Mears. No problem at all once he got there. It appears that Rick is just not handling as good as he should. I'm not making excuses for Al Pasadena. Little Al always goes better in the race than he does in practice and qualifying. In fact, I knew that he was going to be tough all day that way. I really believe that Rick and the Penske's have missed on their track settings just a little bit, Paul. Well, Bobby, that seems to be true of many drivers, that they race much faster than they practice or qualify. Why? Well, just a guess on what the setups are going to be. Look at Al cutting under the white line. If you watch Rick when he comes by pretty soon, you'll see that he'll stay above the white line. What happens is they all have to guess at their settings for race day. They really don't know exactly what it's going to be like. Sometimes, because they're so finely tuned, they miss it just a little bit. So well, Alonzo Jr., once he is able to get past Rick Mears and get a firm grip on fourth place, he begins to pull away just now, and Rick Mears continues to fall a little backwards. But let's remember that it was a year ago that Rick Mears fell a full lap behind the race at about this point, and then, of course, came back to win. And this is the time during the race, ball that the racetrack will get just a little bit slippery. But the bug just hit the windshield or on the camera. <laughs> The racetrack will get just a little bit slippery. Danny Sullivan soon, sits in his car. And pretty soon it'll go away and the track will come back again. And you'll see a lot harder race. You see the cars group up a lot more then. All right, so Danny Sullivan has his problems today. As uh, they continue, though, to apparently plan to get that car back into action. Well, the Penske attitude is if you can make it run, you try your best. And even if it's many laps down, they may put Danny back out on the track. You know, we see as we ride with Al Unser Jr. here, Al, when he rejoined Team Gallus, which is the team he drives for now after an absence of three years, he did so, and with the chemistry of the moment, he came back really as the leader of the team. And although he's only 27 years old, he has considerable self-esteem and confidence, and he's certainly being vindicated right now. You can see how low he was running on the track. There's, There's Sullivan, Sullivan going back out, and he must have temporarily at least got his troubles fixed, or maybe he got him fixed good, but he doesn't seem to be in a lot of a hurry. But you can watch Al now as he comes down into the turn. He'll get under, well, he didn't do it there, but he's been running under the white line a little bit because of the traffic. All right, Al Unser Jr. continues to circle this course in fourth place. We ask him, if you hadn't become a race driver, then what would you have become? If I hadn't have become a race car driver, uh, I would be inclined to uh, fly jets, fly airplanes. Uh, not, uh, I would want to, I would want to fly the, the the most technically advanced airplane that there is, is what I would want to fly. You know, Little Al's favorite expression is the word neat. When things are going well, he says neat. I wouldn't be a bit surprised if he wasn't saying that to himself right now because things are going well. It's not just Little Al's work. <laughs> You're right. It's an Unser family uh, trait. Bobby Unzer has said it too. By the way, Danny Sullivan was in the pits for three minutes and 13 seconds on four with Michael Andretti now as he begins to close down on his dad. Michael runs in third. His dad is in second place just ahead, so it's an inner team battle for second place. The Andretti family in a few. Now on the, just a little note on the car setups, Bob. I was looking at the, you can look at Michael Mario. He's going to be right underneath the white line there all the way. But the setups on the Penske cars, for example, between the Penske team and the Emerson Fittipaldi Pat Patrick team. One of them, like for example, Penske has a real small rear wing, big wicker bill on the back. There's Danny Sullivan back in the pits again. And then the other car has of Emerson Fittipaldi has the big wing with the small wicker bill. To totally two different concepts going into this race. Here and comes Michael going to try his dad. They're on the back stretch. Michael comes to the inside. A whole line of cars just in front. Michael has to get down on the binders hard in the third turn, but Michael gets her. He had to break hard, Paul, to hit, keep him hitting that car that he was coming upon and then he was laughing there. Traffic got really tight for a while. But it just gives you an idea, like I was saying, of the different concept that you can do with different cars at this racetrack. 
Michael Andretti, then for Old Boy Sell, just alongside. It's not a pass to position because Michael has second place right now. The car ahead is the 20 car of the Emerson Fittipaldi that he will now set his sights on. 50 laps, or one-fourth of the Indianapolis 500 are complete. I think Michael has been probably the best handling car so far that we've watched, other than Emerson Fittipaldi. Of course, Emerson's not been in the passing race. He's leading the race. But watch Michael as he passes cars. He can just go with the inside and like across the short shoot. Right here, he just drives right on by them. Not too many guys do that. Now, a few moments ago, we said that Danny Sullivan on his long stop before he came back in was in the pits for three minutes and 13 seconds. In today's terms, that means he dropped about eight miles behind the race. Well, you know, it's interesting as we watch Michael rip past his father. Continuing fight here. This is a fight for third place between Mario Andretti and Little Al. It makes you think really about the father and son business because Mario let Michael by. Uh, absolutely. There is Al Unser Jr. tucking back in behind Mario. A classic battle among all of these great drivers today. He tries to get to the inside. You can see that it gets rough when you get down below that line. Another reason not to drive there. The track flattens out once you're down under there. Mario just screaming. Here comes Little Al coming to the high side. Slower car just ahead. Little Al trying to pace his way now onto the main stretch. Looking to his mirrors to see where Mario is. Mario is right there as well as they continue their fight down into the first turn. Both very low, trying to avoid that slower car sitting just ahead. Well, that slower car is really holding him up, really making an exciting race out of him. I guarantee he's got them worried an awful lot. They're having a weave back and forth, making them not know where the other guy's going to go, and they're running all the way down to the track. Couldn't be worried about that car ahead. That's Rick Bowler. He's one of the real veterans of the tight ovals and midgets and sprints and he really knows how to get away around an oval as little Al continues to work his way past some slower cars and work his way around the Indianapolis Motor Speedway currently running in third place. Mario is now caught up in traffic behind. Yeah but Rich Vogler has had some problems here crashing uh, three out of four last races that he ran here but always at the third mark if you assume he's safer now. You know interesting about the father and son well, we'll get we'll get to that in just a second because uh, Jack Aroon is down with uh, Danny Sullivan. Uh, Jack and Sam, I'm sure Danny Sullivan is somewhat relieved to have this month of May over a faulty clutch pitch out of the race. Yeah, I just uh, lost all the drive. It just uh, coming down the straightaway. I was on the gas and just spinning, so um, figured I wasn't getting wheel spin at that speed. The Chevrolet wasn't that quite that strong. The question about the arm. You didn't stay in very long, but how does it feel? Feels okay. I didn't uh, seem like I had any problems. We had just started to adjust the car. We had a radio problem. Um, I didn't like losing a lap early on, but we would have been okay. Now, 14 Penske, there doesn't seem to be the domination that we've seen in other years. Fittipaldi is broken to the front. Have maybe the Penske team missed the setup just a little bit this morning? Well, it's a long race. We're not very far into it. Don't forget last year, I ran away early on and hid, and, and uh, Rick and Al came back, so we'll see. To reinforce that, Paul Page, we did check with the crew chief on Rick Mears' car, and he said that's precisely it. They've set a race pace. They're not at all concerned. And they said wait till the second half of the event. Well, Rick Mears, Danny Sullivan's teammate, runs back in sixth place right now. There is the leader, Emerson Fittipaldi. He has led right from the green flag through a 12-lap caution period and through the first 100, 125 miles of this Indianapolis 500. Of course, we should remember that at this point in the race last year, Rick Mears was one lap down and he came back to win. Emerson Fittipaldi is out in front at the Indianapolis 500. We'll be back with more live from Indianapolis after this. And it seems that that crowd gets larger every year. Bobby Rahal stopped on the racetrack and they have brought out the yellow flag as a result of this situation. He's gonna to have to be towed in. Bobby Rahal stopped on the course. Bobby Rahal signed with that team, Craco, this year for $1 million. So this is uh, a man being paid a million dollars. And the leader to be is gonna make a stop under this yellow. Comes at a pretty good time for the leaders, really. He last stopped on his 34th lap. We're now on the 61st lap. They've gone almost 30 laps on Emerson Fittipaldi and the Patrick team making a stop. Here's Jack Aroon. Well, their Chip Ganassi, who's, the crew, who's one of the co-owners, was waving at the crew because there was a giant piece of plastic on the front wing. They finally got pulled away. 
They have changed to the harder compound tires, as we said, as Rick Mears and Al Unser Sr. make their way onto pit road. All the lead cars have now gone to the harder compound tire. The softer tires are now put aside, and when we talk to the fellows here, as Al Unser Jr. also goes by, they're all gonna stay with the harder tires. So the tire story has become less of a story now as we near the quarter mark of the race. Here's Al Unser making his stop again, again looking from the crew cam, and there is Rick Mears coming out of the pits, both Penske cars that are left in the race with the retirement of Danny Sullivan now make their stops, and they're back into the action. They're all three, Emerson, Fittipaldi, Rick, and Al, all three have 14 and a half second stops. The pit crews are really competitive. Like Sam was saying early, it could fall on the pit crews today, Paul. So the field now begins to form up behind a pace car, though you can see most of the cars are in the pits. Are in the pits, yeah. At this point, of course, these pit stops are like board meetings. I mean, everybody is trying to decide exactly what to do. There's so many things, as you see Mario stopping, that can be changed. The tires, of course, and you see them changing three there, as well as refueling the car. But there's the question of the wings, uh, especially that front wing can be uh, easily changed at its angle. Look at the fire coming out. That's fairly standard stuff, believe it or not, as spectacular as it looks. Then what happens there is the paint is burning underneath the wing. All right, so now the number five car and ready back into the action at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. 62 laps complete. By the way, there's more racing action coming up this afternoon. Round number one of the International Race of Champions from Daytona International as that four race series, world champion drivers in identical cars face off with one another at the International Race of Champions. That's right after our live telecast of the Indianapolis 500 mile race. We're still under yellow at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway, the tow in for Bobby Rahal. And there was a problem in Tom Sneva's pit, but very quickly it was doused. There was a little flash of fire. Tom Sneva's car was rolled back away from it. Apparently a little bit of a fuel spill. Sneva bailed out of that car like the athlete that he is. He hadn't anticipated running a full season this year. He really made up his mind, Tom Sneva had, to retire in the world of golf and maybe only do a few races. When this offer came through, he took it, but it's been funny. It's been hard for him, I think, in some ways to get back into the idea that he's a full-time racing driver. What you saw right on the ground there was water that was poured in because if you mix water with the alcohol, the methanol alcohol, it just makes it where it just really won't burn. That's uh, we ought to point out. You can put an alcohol fire out with water, but don't you ever throw water on gasoline? No, fire. And of course, there's no gasoline in any of these cars here. Everyone is here with methanol alcohol. It makes it a lot safer, Paul. Well, there is the Airship America, the Goodyear Blimp, based out of Houston, Texas. This is the 25th year that a Goodyear Blimp has floated lazily over the Indianapolis 500, and they're giving you shots like this. Tremendous shots. It used to just be a nice, pretty shot, but now you can see first and second place as they set themselves up under the yellow flag. It becomes actually part of the race coverage as technology continues to improve in the coverage of motorsports. Under yellow at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway, 63 laps complete. All 63 are being scored to Emerson Fittipaldi, who jumped in the lead right at the start. Bobby Rahal sits by the edge of the course waiting for his crew to come up to the north end of the pits and bring him down for service. Apparently, he's just a matter of him being out of fuel and running out on the track. We take a look at the conclusion, actually going back to lap 50 at the rundown at that time. Fittipaldi, Andretti, Unser Jr., Mario Andretti, Rick Mears, Al Unser, Ari Leyendijk, Bobby Rahal, Jim Crawford, and then a lap behind the leaders, Boisel, Pomroth, Brayton, Dobson, A.J. Foyt, now two laps behind the leaders, as is Scott Pruitt, running in 15th place, then Davy Jones, then John Jones, Billy Bukovic the third, then going three laps down, Ludwig Heimrath Jr., Rich Vogler runs in 20th place, Didier Taze and Bernard Jourdain also three behind the race. John Andretti, four laps behind in 23rd. We look down through the rest of the field now. 30 cars. Teo Fabi is running in 30th, 27 laps behind. And, of course, some of those cars are out of the Indianapolis 500. That's a rundown of all 33 cars in the 500. And with the improved scoring that we have, 
That's, I think, the first time we've ever seen all 33 in the running of the race. I think if you have an overview of what's happened, it's the surprise that Fittipaldi has dominated the Penske team as much as he has. In turn, the Penskes have not been as strong as we anticipated. The Andrettis have almost taken the Penske place. They've moved up Michael Andretti, of course, from way, way back into second place. So it's been a race, to this point, filled with surprises. Again, let's go back to 50 laps for those who like to keep score of this race. And we'll take a look at the summary. Emerson Fittipaldi, the leader of the race at 50 laps, an average speed of 148.3 miles an hour. Not nearly a record, but pretty close to last year's pace. It was just almost identical to last year. One caution, that was Kevin Kogan's situation. That was a long caution, Paul. The race pace has really been fast. Uh, Notice that Bobby Ray Hall is going to be out of the race. I think their problem with Bobby Ray Hall is very possibly the short stroke Cosworth. We've just got a few of the cars already being scored out of the Indianapolis 500. But now the pace car comes back off the course once again. Dwayne Sweeney, the starter, has the green flag. And Emerson Fittipaldi roars past the 59 car. Carol Palmer continuing to lead here at the Indianapolis 500. But it will be a battle at the front of the field because there sits Michael Andretti just behind the leader. Boy, I tell you, Paul, that Michael Andretti take the shot at Emma when they came up that fourth turn and down the front straight away. He was really hoping that he was going to catch Emma behind that left car in front of him. Box him in and be able to pass it. That Michael is really handling good today. Michael chasing Emerson Fittipaldi. Some bad luck for Scotsman Jim Crawford, who was lapped by the leader Fittipaldi just two laps before the yellow caution came out. He remained ahead of Emma on the track, but he would have been able to close up on the field if he could have gotten around him. Mario told me, Michael is not as patient as I am. He has always done well. He deserves the best. But if there's a flaw in anything he does, it's that he's fairly impatient. He wants to get ahead quickly. He may not be able to get up to Emerson, but if he does, it'll be interesting to see how he handles the situation, Bob. And as the day progresses on, watch Michael's groove. Michael has a groove around this track all of his own. He'll run lower, not only in the turn, the short shoots, he'll run lower, and in the long straightaways, he'll run lower. He is literally the only car on the track that runs that type of a groove. Now, his dad, Probably the next closest to it. But Emerson Fittipaldi, as we'll see the two of them running together, will be in a totally standard like Rick Mears or an Al Unser group. Michael Andretti works his way around the Indianapolis Motor Speedway, and it's two and a half miles in second place. That's the leader, Fittipaldi, ahead as you ride on board with second place. The car sits so low to the pavement, and there's Al Sr. coming into the pits. Jack Arood is there as Al Unzer rolls down toward the Penske pits for service. Let's go to Jack. And Paul, the report on the radio is that Al Unzer Sr., like his teammate Danny Sullivan, is experiencing a clutch problem. Rick Reinemann, the crew chief for the team, looks it over as the crew, six, six men over the wall, try to make an adjustment, but so far it's been to no avail. They are not taking on fuel. They're doing nothing but trying to adjust towards the rear of the car. Now this, again, will certainly put him out of strong contention to win this event. You can hear as he tries to work the clutch back to get the car into gear, and it seems to be not working as well as he would hope. Now the problem with that, Paul, is, is that the clutch is slipping. And what they're trying to do is to give it more free travel. Somehow or another, maybe the hydraulic pressure has built up some heat, expand it, causing the clutch to release just a little bit. This will be disastrous if they can't fix it. A long 28-second stop as Roger Penske watches over his team. Well, Penske, more than anybody, approaches this almost in a military fashion and knows what strength in numbers means. He started the race with three cars. In effect, he has only one left to him now. Rick Mears, and this race isn't even halfway over. So this is not the kind of race that Roger likes to see develop at all. Al still working his way around the track, trying to come up to speed, but it is not rolling fast. The clutch is still a problem. That would leave Roger Penske with only one hope, the number four car of Rick Mears, and it currently lies in fourth place. Keep another thing in mind, Paul. It could be that all three cars, remember, they are identical cars. The setups are almost identical on them. 
Could it be that three of them are going to have the same problem? That's the problem they had last year with the wings breaking, the wing bracket. It's possible. That's what's so important about the Indianapolis 500. It is the first race at 500 miles of the year. The furthest distance these cars have seen in head-to-head -head combat has been 200 miles. So once they get beyond that, they're into new territory. The view of the great Indianapolis Motor Speedway, first and second, work their way through the short shoot at the north end. Fittipaldi leads. Michael Andretti runs in second. Then Little Al. Then Rick Mears, the hope of the Penske team. And then Mario Andretti. We'll be back with more coverage of the Indianapolis 500 after this message and a word from our ABC stations. We're back live at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. You watch Al Unser's team work on the car from the crew cam on Rick Reinemann's radio. The gal still sits in the car. Apparently, they feel that there is an opportunity to repair this car and get it back into the run. I'm Paul Page with Sam Posey and Bobby Unser. We're at the 73rd running of the great Indianapolis 500. Roger Penske stays in Rick Mears pit, concerned mostly with that car, but of course his concerns spreads to this car and the entire team. One of his cars, Danny Sullivan's, is already out. There's the Penske record thus far at the Indianapolis 500, the winningest owner by far now, looking ahead to maybe his eighth Indianapolis 500 mile race win. His eighth, yes, but at this point last year, although Rick had had problems with his car, they were able to fix them and he was already moving up. They've had two chances already to adjust Rick's car in this race, and he is not moving up. There's the leader, Emerson Fittipaldi, car number 20, out of the Patrick Racing Stable as he works his way off of the back stretch and into the third turn. Blind around this course, 210, 211 miles an hour. He's laying down at forward pace. Emerson Fittipaldi has a very good engineer. It's a guy that I have the utmost respect for. Dave Morris Nunnies from England, like many of the other mechanics and engineers, but he takes a different outlook at everything. And during setting up this car during the month of May, it isn't like Emo to be looking at what the Penske team is doing. They just get their own way. And as we look at it right now, it looks like his decision must have been pretty good. It's funny, I don't think last year Emerson Fittipaldi was quite psychologically ready to win the Indy 500. Despite having been world champion twice, this place seemed to awe him. But when he was second last year, it definitely opened the door to the possibility of what we're seeing. There's his wife, Teresa. Boy, does she make a great drink, incidentally. Vodka mixed with uh, orange juice and uh, lemon. I mean, it's terrific. And by the way, when they got the uh, car under the front row of the grid two weeks ago, they celebrated with that drink. This team is riding a high. I, who knows how far they may ride that. All right, let's go to the pits now. Jack Arood is with Roger Penske. Well, a couple of seconds ago we were. We went to talk to Roger, and he waved us off, and I think that's a good indication of just how concerned he is about his situation right now. Two of his top cars are already out with clutch problems. But we check with Richard Buck, who is the crew chief for this car this year, and he says so far Rick Mears is still setting the pace that they set yesterday in a meeting at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. Al Sr. in the meantime is out of the car, so that's two of the three Team Penske entries that are out of this 73rd running of the Indianapolis 500. So the Penske team in battle very early on. Now their hopes definitely lie with this man, the bright yellow number four car. It is Rick Mears. In the last 12 years here at Indy, Penske cars have six wins, four second places. And Mario Andretti is beginning to close in on Mears. Mears occupies fourth place. Mario is closing. All the bright heads in the Penske crews will get together as soon as they get all Al's car cleared from the pit stop. They'll all be trying to figure out what can they do to tune Rick's car during the next pit stop as the race goes on to try to get him more competitive with Emerson Pitt Paul. I think they've got their job cut out for him. Yeah, I think so too. Roger, you know, is not the sort of person that is upset by not doing well. I mean, I'm reminded of a line about Margaret Thatcher in Time Magazine last week who said, you know, she's somebody that offers you spinach and not candy. And Roger does that too. And in times of adversity, he does not become shaken by what's going on. Rick Mears, the number four car, runs in fourth place, but Mario Andretti is closing down. He's closing at about four tenths of a second a lap. Well, he certainly is. Uh, it's going to take a. We have a story from Brian Hammond in the pit right now on the tires, Bo. Bobby, the last time that Mario and Michael pitted, their right side tires were badly blistered. Now, they did not change to the harder compound of the Goodyear tires. All they did was 
adjust the tire pressure. So they really like the tire, but they don't want to switch to what might be a little bit slower tire in the harder compound. Now Mario has another problem. When he backs out of the throttle in traffic, he has a misfire. But otherwise, he's okay. Back to you, Paul. All right. So the tires, a concern here always, but they seem to be performing their assigned role here as we continue to watch the defending champions, Rick Mears and Mario Andretti, closing in. Auto number one. Mario continues his closure. In through number two. On to the long back stretch. On to the main stretch. What's it like in Rick Mears' car right now as we look at it? He knows, obviously, he is being outpaced by a team with an identical car, the Emerson Fittipaldi team. Is he shaken by this? I doubt it very much. All right, let's go to the pits. Jack Arrud is with Al Unser. Well, as we had reported, a faulty clutch has put Danny Sullivan and now you, Al Unser, out of the, out of the contention for the race today and out of it. And what can you do when you have a situation like that? Well, it's heartbreaking for myself and for the crew and for Marlboro. You know, we hate it, but uh, it's just something that happened to the clutch, and uh, that's all I can do. Yeah, but now, no sooner had you gotten out of the car than they hustled you down here to where Roger Penske is perched in front of Rick Mears' pit. Now, what conversation did you have with him? All that was was to try to, because we've had two cars go out with the same problem, to see if I could tell him anything to tell him. There is Rick Mears continuing his fight. Ex excuse me, I don't mean to interrupt, but... <laughs> We have a good fight going on on the race course right now. Rick Mears battling continually with Mario. Let's go back to the pits again. Well, Paul, as we were talking to Alan Sir Sr., Rick Mears is still battling with Mario Andretti, but is there anything that this team now can do to adjust Rick Mears' car to maybe save that clutch? Well, the only thing he can do is to be careful with it. He can't, he can't abuse it when he makes these pit stops. I didn't think I did, but I, I must have. Uh, I don't know why it starts slipping. So as Al Sr. says, most importantly, it will come into play when they enter and exit the pits, and they'll have to treat it very gingerly now, Paul Page. Well, All right, Jack Aruth. of course, now the prospect of Al Unser becoming the first five-time winner here at the Speedway. It's not going to happen this year. Rick Mears, of course, still on the track, currently running fourth, has a shot at moving up into a tie with Al Unser with four wins. And Rick Mears. Still in fourth place, still being chased by Mario. Now there's nothing Rick can do with his clutch right now, incidentally. His foot's off the clutch pedal. He just keeps it close to the brake pedal. He's not worried about using the clutch. What happens is that the hydraulic clutch, the mechanism, the hydraulic run to the back and probably just doesn't have enough free travel in it. Sometimes you go to the garage, you get your clutches adjusted. That's the problem that they're having with these right now, would be my guess. All right, Rick Mears works his way around Scott Pruitt and manages to put Pruitt between himself and Mario Andretti. That's Rocky Moran lying just ahead of Rick Mears, the 33 car who had the problems at the start of the race as we take a look at Rick Mears blistering up this racetrack. And Mario Andretti stays in pursuit in a fight for fourth place. At the front of the field, it is still Emerson Fittipaldi. And he is being chased by Michael Andretti and Al Unser Jr. Back live at the Indianapolis 500 and somewhat slowly Mario Andretti rolls into the pits. He was running in fifth place as now the Newman Haas team goes to work on that car. And he came rolling in perhaps right at the end of his fuel tank because he was just creeping along as he rolled up to his pit. Well, that's very possible, Paul. They don't know this early in the race exactly what the gas mileage has been. It's got partially the yellows. They really don't get good mileage readings. All right, let's go to that pit. Brian Hammonds. Pulling in without power. Mario Andretti is sitting in what is now a dead race car. They're ready to take the cowling off. They'll probably change the spark box. That's the first thing they change. The engine just died on him, Paul. All right, so Mario Andretti with a little bit more of a problem. Emerson Fittipaldi, the leader of the race, also made a stop. In doing so under the green flag, turned the lead over to Mario's son, Michael Andretti. Allenser Jr. fell into second place then, and Emerson Fittipaldi came back out in third place. Rick Mears continues in fourth, but here he is on the pit road and rolling down toward Richard Buck and the Penske team for some fast Penske service. Now, he already knows that they have clutch problems. He's going to be very easy on his clutch. Possibly, they'll even try to give it a little bit more free play. They'll decide whether they can take it. That doesn't look like they're going to do it right now. They can't take the time to do it right now. They have to gamble on going on, and they did. 
Car came out of the pits fairly strong. A 14 and 7 tenths pit stop as Rick Mears rolls back into the action and looks like the clutch there at least is still hooking up. We're on board with the leader, Michael Andretti right now. It's his way around the speedway as we approach the halfway point at the Indianapolis 500. A new leader for the first time in the race. Michael Andretti taking over the lead, but still, he must make a pit stop. And when he does so, then it is very possible that Emerson Fittipaldi will assume the lead once again. Yes, indeed. Michael, we guess, maybe has one to two more laps in the lead, but it's a heavy experience to lead this race, even if it's because here's There's Crawford. Jim Crawford. Crawford was running in fifth place as he came in for his stop. His Buick engine still working for him. One of the question marks here. Also, as we watch Crawford, second place, Al Unser Jr. rolls into the pits. Flipping his engine, he was running in second place as he rolled in. Let me make a quick p a point about the way Al just pulled into the pits. Very organized, very calm. I think this man is pleased with the way things are going and feels in control of the situation. He didn't feel a need to rush into the pit. And their game plan was not to worry so much the first half of the race, try to be smart, don't get laughed, really come on strong in the second half of the race. And that looks like exactly what they're doing. Michael Andretti in the lead of the race. Let's go to Brian. Michael gets four new tires. He already has a full load of fuel, waiting to take off. They're holding him just for a second, so the last of the fuel can say now. There he goes. Michael Andretti leaves, and the tires don't seem to be blistered. We'll find out exactly what compound he put back in the car. There's Michael Andretti, his visor is still up. He should reach up, there he does, closes it as he hits the end of the pit lane. That's the first time that Michael's led at Indianapolis since 1986 when he led the opening 42 laps. But as he was in the pits, Emerson Fittipaldi got past and back into the lead. Let's go to Jack Aru. Well, Emerson Fittipaldi was the first of the leaders to put on pit road, and in contrast to the way Al Unser Jr. came into the pits, Emo came in a tad hot. He locked up the wheels and skidded to a halt Chip Ganassi, you're the co-owner of the Patrick Racing team. It was a little bit out of the ordinary, but the crew went to work and didn't make any adjustments at all in the car except for fuel. Why? No adjustments. Emerson's very happy with how the car's running. We're right according to plan. We're half the distance here and a lot of race left. Do you think about it, the win at all right now, or do you not, just not want to talk about it? Not at all. we got a lot of race to go here. I've been here a lot of times, Jack, and there's a lot of hell of a lot of race to go. Well, that's the story from Fittipaldi's pit, but they are certainly counting on more of the, what they've seen in the beginning of this race. All right, Chip Ganassi here now as a car owner, as a race driver for a number of years. Emerson Fittipaldi back into the lead of the 500. And here is the Michael Andretti car moving around the corner. You know, Paul, you mentioned that Michael hasn't led for three years. How he did he is to lead? Michael Andretti runs in second place. In third place is Al Enzer Jr. Let's, let's just be quiet for a moment and listen and ride with Michael Andretti. Michael Andretti, he currently runs in second place behind the leader of the race, two-time world driving champion, Emerson Fittipaldi. In third place is Al Unser Jr. Rick Mears is a lap behind the race in fourth. We'll be back. We're back live at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. Beautiful blue skies overhead. The pylon that scores the cars at the start-finish line. The drivers actually use that as a reference point. Look up and see what position they're being scored in. And when Emerson Fittipaldi looks up, 
He is being shown in position number one, the leader of the Indianapolis 500. He's been a dominant force as you watch from the blimp overhead, and he works his way around this circuit at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. The average speed of the race at the halfway point, 100 laps, just two laps ago, was 167.9 miles an hour. Paul, the ironic thing about it is that has to do with pit stops and yellows. Emerson Fittipaldi has really raised the price of poker racing-wise. He's been running 200 and 217 and 218 mile an hour laps, and that is awesome at this point in the race. Emerson Fittipaldi was not expected to dominate the race quite the way he has now, but when you think of this man's long and fascinating life in some ways, it really is no surprise. In fact, Emerson, in a sense, has had three lives, three complete, separate, and successful lives. His first, of course, and the one that is perhaps still to this day best known, was as a Formula One driver. He was a racing prodigy, and he developed so fast that he won the first of his two world championships when he was just 26 years old. Here he is winning that first championship at Monza, in 1972. His second life was as a retired racing driver, a budding business entrepreneur. This is a 200,000 acre orange tree plantation in Aracuara, Brazil. A Mercedes-Benz dealership and automotive accessory company uh, followed. He's not maybe a threat yet to Roger Penske, but he is a very wealthy and successful man. And I say quickly, his third life, of course, is as an Indy driver. And you see the two people that are supporting him the most in that, his wife, Teresa, and his car owner, the oil man, Pat Patrick. Well, the question, Bobby Unser, that has been worrying me for the past few laps, we know that the clutch system on two of the Penske cars, two PC-18, has had a problem. It hasn't manifested itself yet on Rick Mears car. But if it's a design problem, then does the same design exist on the leader's PC-18? Well, Paul, I really don't think by now because we've got two of them had the problem, two of them have not had the problem. I don't think it's a design problem. I think it's a mere matter of an adjustment and the hydraulic foot getting hot and just releasing the clutch gently. There's the 1986 Rookie of the Year in IndyCars, Dominic Dobson, as he works his way around this track. What a great story he's been today. He started 29th. He's now running in ninth place. 20 positions he moved up. Watch for Dominic Dobson in the next few years. He is somebody that is on every top car owner's short list of drivers that they would like to hire if one of their key men drops out. Dominic Dobson from Stuttgart, Germany, has a big future in this sport. He's a very sensible man. He has an engineering background. He keeps calm in almost any circumstances. Big future. Military parents born over in Stuttgart. I spent a little time in Stuttgart. My dad was in the Army, too. And a lot of us spent time in Stuttgart, Germany. Now, of course, it's that area from which the Porsche comes. We take a look as Dominic Dobson comes down the main stretch at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. He had a great run at Phoenix earlier this year. He's really taking to these ovals. So we'll keep our eyes on Dominic Dobson. 29 leader, years old. Leader of the race continues to be Emerson Fittipaldi. Second place is Michael Andretti. Al Unser Jr. is in third place, but he is a lap behind the leader of the race. Let's go to the pits, Jerry Punch. Well, Paul Page, it's my pleasure to report a good report on Kevin Kogan. Just moments ago, I talked with Catherine Wash Miller down at Methodist Hospital of Indiana, and 33-year-old Kevin Kogan has been released. Now he has abrasions and contusions, basically bumps and bruises, and that's all. A miracle when his March Cosworth was severed in half up out of turn four. So Kevin Kogan released just moments ago, Paul. That's absolutely amazing. That same accident 25 years ago would have resulted in a true tragedy. And here, Kevin Kogan. Okay. That's right, Paul. And if you remember seeing that shot which happened earlier in the show, the engine came completely loose. The transmission engine gathered from the car almost came in and hit him in the cockpit while the car was into the wall. So it's just short of a miracle that Kevin is as good as he is, is and we're certainly happy. Last night I was over at the motel adjacent to the track where many of the drivers stay, and I was asked, uh, what about the fast speed of the race? There's Paul Newman as he watches both Michael and Mario Andretti. He, of course, is one of the co-owners, along with Carl Haas at Newman. I was asked, how fast will the fastest lap of the race be? Well, take a look at Emerson Fittipaldi. My guess was 221 miles an hour. He just cut a lap 
at 220 miles an hour while he was running in the open. Then he came back into traffic and his lap speed dropped off to 216 miles an hour. But they're setting an incredible pace at the Indianapolis 500. Now the record to this point is Bobby Rahal's record from 1986 of about 176.2 miles an hour. Emerson Fittipaldi drops low to get past A.J. Foyt. 176 is the record. They're just nine miles behind that right now, but they're running very clean at the moment, and we just may see a record race. It's an incredible thing, you know, merely uh, to, to lead this race, but merely to be in the race, to be a driver in the Indy 500 puts you in pretty exclusive company. You figure there are 624 players playing right now in Major League Baseball, whereas from the first race here in 1911 until now, the whole history of this event, only 580 men and of course one woman have competed. 580 men, one woman, that woman being Janet Lester, who ran her last race here just 10 years ago. Emerson Fittipaldi works his way around the Indianapolis Motor Speedway, the key factor in the Indianapolis 500-mile race, down the home stretch. A man who really concentrates on his race driving, concentration being so critical, we ask him, how difficult is it to be focused? I think it's is a demand on yourself, um, on yourself with time of experience uh, and knowing exactly what you are doing. You can be under pressure, but you can be focused without being nervous about it. I think that's a big difference on being focused, under pressure, but not being nervous. And as long as you can separate that, uh, normally on my, myself as a racing driver, under pressure, I do my best, under a lot of pressure. Um, and I think with as more pressure as I have, I'm able exactly what you ask, to focus more and concentrate more. Emerson Fittipaldi now focused on a pit stop. Jack Arruda is there. And Patrick team has gone to work. They're taking out as much fuel as possible. He's been given the signal to go out of the pit. A very good stop. Now, here, just before the, the stop, we were hearing, and one of the crew members was over listen, listening to the USAC radios, and there was some talk as to whether Fittipaldi would be warned about passing below the white line. So far, no one from USAC has come to this crew and formally registered a complaint about it, but they, in monitoring USAC, are somewhat concerned about it as well because they've heard the USAC officials talking about it on the radio. And you watch Michael Andretti pick up the lead of the race, car number six there, when Emerson Fittipaldi made his stop. And of course, we mentioned that white line as a real concern. The officials do not want competitors running routinely and continuously below the white line. So they will be very, very careful to watch these cars. There you see Michael gets four wheels under the line. Four wheels is the quantity that they're concerned about. And now this race is over the halfway point now. 113 laps are now complete, and they're beginning to pick the pace up now. We go back to the start of this Indianapolis 500, which started with just incredibly beautiful weather here, the 73rd running of the 500, as a show of smoke at the back of Rick Mears' car. The last of the Penske Hope is now showing smoke at the back of the car. He was running in fourth. There is his wife, Chris Mears, on the scoring stand. She is in radio contact. She can hear what Rick is saying now, and he is reporting a situation on that car that is not going to please Roger Penske. Well, Paul, we can't be for sure right now, but most likely that's going to be an engine problem. It's definitely a serious problem. Problem because Let's go to the pits, Jack Aroot. Well, the report is from Dan Lugenbuehl, who is the information director, is that Rick Mears may have lost the Chevrolet engine. He brings the car down onto pit road, and it is not running. It is smoking. He lifts the visor. They're going to take the bonnet off. But it is over for Rick Mears and over for Team Penske in 19. 89 as well. Roger Penske talking to Rick. Rick getting out of the car. As the crew goes to work, it will not be a Team Penske car in Victory Lane today. It could still be a PC-18 if your leader, Emerson Fittipaldi, continues upon his leading way. What a terrible disappointment for that incredibly intense man, Roger Penske. His three cars were definitely the benchmark, the fastest cars in the sport, first and second in this qualifying field. And now, 
past the halfway point, all three are out of the race. And that means two out of the three front row starters are out of the race. Maybe that superstition I mentioned earlier the whole way. Well, we talked about this entire situation right at the beginning of our telecast here today. Would this man be able to score again and earn a fourth 500 victory? It will not happen, nor will it happen for Al Unzer. The entire Penske team is out of the 500-mile race. Michael Andretti still has the lead of the race with Emerson Fittipaldi running in second. Well, we'll be back with more coverage of the Indianapolis 500 right after this message and a word from our ABC station. We're back at the Indianapolis 500. Kathy Penske, Roger's wife. The family has moved from being participants to observers at the Indianapolis 500 as she sits and watches the crew. There is Roger. The rest of the team, Rick Mears, Dan Logan Buell. Peter Gibbons, they all discuss what has happened to their race cars today. They you are notice all you three out. You notice, Paul, you don't really see a lot of sadness on Roger's face. He really is sad inside, but he knows this is just another bit of He lost the race today. You will worry about it tonight when he goes to race. Mario Andretti, as he works his way around the Indianapolis Motor Speedway, back into the action after that rather long stop, and now you ride on board with the leader. Michael Andretti, second place of Emerson Fittipaldi. Michael is out in front, but a number of questions yet to be answered. We've now seen one Chevrolet racing engine go bad. There is a Chevrolet on this car. We have seen the clutch system on two PC-18s go wrong. There is the same clutch system on Emerson Fittipaldi's car. He is currently running in second place. Alan Sir Jr. runs in third. He has a Chevrolet engine as well. Jim Crawford with the Buick engine is two laps off the pace. Raul Boisel with the Judd engine is four laps back. So the story is now beginning to play at the Indy 500. It certainly is, Paul, but it's a long ways to the finish line number one. There's a little Al coming into the pits, but the main thing to remember today is they're really losing these engines hard. The race speeds have really been high today. So Al Unser Jr. rolls into the pits. He was running in third place at the time that he headed in. The crew very methodically, very carefully, but very quickly goes to work on the car. That crew won the pit stop contest. They're very good, Paul. They did without mistakes. They're really working together in harmony lately. 17 and a half seconds, and Al Unser Jr. is back into the fight. It's interesting. It's been a story of big teams having big trouble today. Penske, of course, all three of his cars out. The powerful Andretti team, one of their two, uh, crippled. And the Ray Hall team, one of one, out. As we see Michael Andretti. And of course, it's Rick Gallus' concept. Here we are on board with Michael, showing his head buffeting in the air. Really not very bad, considering he's running well over 200 miles there. There he is into the pits. The leader of the race comes down, makes his stop, rolling into the pit area. You see the vent valve out in front, and Emerson Fittipaldi comes back, picks up the lead of the race as Michael makes this pit stop. The team already at the back of the car. Michael looking just ahead for that board to be pulled out of the way. He dumps the clutch, and he's back into the action. So Michael Andretti gives up the lead to Emerson Fittipaldi when he makes his stop. Well, he certainly did. Now he pulled the shield back down. He'd be back up the state. Now you can see his head buffeting around as it was before. When you see the back shot, it looks a little bit smoother than it does when that camera reverses. The driver really goes through a lot of buffeting because just imagine sticking your hand out of a window of a car going even 80 miles an hour, much less 230 miles an hour. Michael Andretti back to speed you can see the debris fence that lines this track passing around behind him so Michael moves back into the action stays in second place let's go to the pits and Jack away Rick Mears is the third and final team Penske member that's out of the race and expired engine Rick oh uh, yeah I'm not sure what it is yet the engine clutch or whatever but uh, you know everything was working pretty well we had a, a low valve and I could only run about 43 44 inches of boost and that's all we've had all day long that's what happened on the start but uh, you know other than that the car was really working pretty decent we were just going to start making some small adjustments and go from there we ran a, a 217 lap in there so it wasn't too bad Roger what a difference a year makes last year there was so much jubilation at the end of the race and now you've got three guys that are out of the event just past the halfway mark well, I guess uh, we got to root for Emerson now in our chassis, but uh, these guys did a great job. It's one of those years, I guess, uh, with the clutches, and we don't know what happened to the motor. Evidently, it just locked up, but Rick was telling. telling. 
Looks like we've got a problem on the front straightaway as we were in the middle of talking to Roger and he turned around and looked as if it was Ari Leyendijk. Is it possible, Roger, is it possible that Fittipaldi could experience the same sort of clutch problem as the rest of the fellas seem to have experienced? Well, I really don't know. Everybody puts our car together differently. Uh, they've got a good crew and very experienced, and he's driving a tremendous race. The car's working well. We'll have to wait and see. It's a long race, as you know. Paul, we did check with Mo Nunn, the designer of the car that Emerson Fittipaldi, I mean, the mechanic on the car, car that Emerson Fittipaldi is driving, and he did say that they have made some major modifications, both in side pods and the way they hang parts and pieces on their PC-18. We'll try and check with him and see if he may have included the clutch. Well, Ari Leyendijk, he was running in fifth place when the engine let go on the main stretch. He's now over on the back side of the course. Now, what you're seeing come out of there is water, oil, everything. That's really a blown engine, Paul. I'm sure that is... That's, again, the short stroke Cosworth, just like we had in Bobby Rahal's car. All right, the Flying Dutchman, Ari Leyendijk, with his engine gone, now is out of the race, and that will bring out the yellow flag at 128 laps while they clear Ari off of the race course. Now let's go back to the first lap, the start of the Indianapolis 500. As the green flag came out, it was Emerson Fittipaldi that charged from the outside, swept across the front of both Al Unser and Rick Mears, and picked up the lead, and then began to drive away in the 500-mile race. This is earlier. This is back 128 laps ago at the start of the race. Fittipaldi was not to be caught in the early going. Down the back stretch, he was incredibly fast. Still pulling away from uh, the second place car of Rick Mears. And then lap number two, coming off of the fourth turn, Kevin Kogan lost control, slid out toward the wall, slammed against the inside wall, and then came to an abrupt stop in the pits after the hitting the end of the pit wall. Now, despite what you are looking at here, the report on Kevin Kogan is that he is in fact okay. He struggled out of that car. They dumped water to dilute the methanol fuel so there would be no fire. And Kevin Kogan went to the hospital, Methodist Hospital in Indianapolis, but they say he's going to be pretty sore, but he's going to be just fine. He should be, and he was really happy to see that water. To go through what he went through, just short of a miracle, I think, and to see that, look at there. The engine just totally separates a big chunk is the transmission and the engine together, wheels all over the place. And then when he went into the last part of the wall, the engine almost hit him. Really lucky on that one, Paul. But the lines that connect the fuel tanks, the oil tanks, and the engine and all the coolers are designed to break loose without spilling any fluid. Ari Leyendijk now getting some help from the safety crews as they will try to uh, pull him back into the pit area, but we've already seen that display of vapor at the back of the car, and that engine will not restart. I, I think there's just some sort of a problem yet with the new Cosworth engines, but they'll have them worked out before long. And just seconds ago, while we were reviewing the race, Emerson Fittipaldi came in for what should have been a routine stop as well. Here's Jack Aroot, who was there. And Paul, what happened was what looked to be a normal pit stop turned out to be an inordinately long pit stop. Thank goodness it was under the guise of a caution period because the crew had to go out, change four tires because they discovered near the end of their stop that a right front tire had blistered. Emerson Fittipaldi, liking the setup of the car, has been pleading with them not to make any major changes on the mount, but when they saw the blister, and it was a very tiny one, they elected to change all four tires, so it was an extraordinarily long 37.2 second pit stop but it was under caution, so he still is out front in this race. All right, so Emerson Fittipaldi in and out of the pits only 18 laps after his last stop at 130 laps. That gives the lead to Michael Andretti. We'll be back with more live from Indianapolis. The route that Emerson Fittipaldi blistered the hard tire on the right front. Jack will be watching the other cars now to see if we're going to be having some tire problems as the race gets into the second half now. Come back now, around the fourth turn. Michael picks up the pace, and they stream toward the green flag once again. The pace car into the pits. Michael Andretti sees the green. Emerson Fittipaldi is just three seconds back. As Michael screams across the line, you can see Emerson just sitting back there. But he gets forced to the inside alongside a slower car as they come through the first turn. Emerson Fittipaldi in pursuit now of Michael Andretti. You know
know, last year, Emerson Fittipaldi's team spent four minutes and 30 seconds in the pits compared to Rick Mears' team, which won the race, of course, who spent just one minute and 40 seconds. And some people felt that if there was a weakness in the Pat Patrick team at all, it was perhaps in their pit work. Now, of course, that was a comparison to Penske. Penske team, the Penske team is out. Certainly, the Patrick team is one of the top teams in the business, in the pits, but we did see a problem there. I just well, mentioned it. They've had good pit work so far, Pat, and this last one on changing that tire being a little bit slow there was because they didn't know. They had the hard compound on the car. They really didn't think it went blister. So the pit man is the guy that found it. Emerson Fittipaldi works his way around the course. Now, the difference between the two tires, Bobby, and this situation has developed. What does it mean for Fittipaldi? Well, early in the racing month, Paul, again, with the weather was so cold, they had no problems in the soft compound. As the heat came up, they started having problems. Goodyear brought in a little harder compound tire, and that's when all the fast cars should be on by now. Now, as good as Emmo's handling, if he's having problems with that tire, that means that if Michael were to able to push him real hard, he could blister his tire. Now, Will, if he have a jack of root, and Brian Hammond's checking on the other cars to see if the right front tire is going to cause the race to change. All right, Michael Andretti is out in front of the Indianapolis 500-mile race. Then Emerson Fittipaldi, just a wink of an eye, back. And then 42 seconds behind is Al Unser Jr. Now, the rest of the field down below those positions are all running well off the leader pace. For example, the fourth place car of Jim Crawford is now three laps behind the top three. The fifth place car, that's Raul Boisel, is now five laps behind the leaders of the race. And the sixth place car, which, uh, which belongs to Dominic Dobson, we showed you earlier him moving up through the field, is also five laps behind the leader. So the fight is at the front of this field. No one else at the moment is in contest. Now, Michael is out at clean air. We call clean air now, no traffic call. Now, he's going to be pushing really, really hard to see if he can keep that gap between him and Emmo. Now, Emmo's car has been faster. Jeff, there's Emmo right there. He's been generally faster all day. But will he hurt his tire in trying to catch Ma Michael? That's what's going to be interesting to see. Emerson Fittipaldi chasing and, in fact, closing on Michael. Every 500-mile race has one or two key moments where it seems when you look at it a year later, this was when it was won and lost. I wouldn't be a bit surprised if we're not looking at one of them right in and around now. What's going to happen in the next few minutes? Sam, this is going to be their moment for sure to test each other out to see which one of them really has the most speed. They're both set up good. They're well into the race. The track is going from being slippery to being really good right now. Emerson Fittipaldi chasing Michael Andretti. You can see the distance between the two. 136 laps are complete. Michael Andretti has been turning laps at 217 miles an hour. And as you watch the cars, don't become hypnotized by just following the car. Look at the crowd in the background. Watch how much ground they're really covering. This is Tyler Alexander in the pit. He is the crew chief behind the Andretti team, rumored to be leaving that team after this race is to be a swan song with the Andrettis. If so, he's certainly masterminding a terrific race for the Andretti family right now. Chris Tyler came here with Team McLaren, scored a couple of victories there as well, and then stepped away from Indy cars for a while and then came back with the Newman Haas team. So if, in fact, he leaves after this race, we may, in fact, see him again. Let's go down to the pits again. Here's Jack. Well, we were talking about the PCA teams and the clutch problems that they've had. We checked with Morris Nunn, who's one of the designers or engineers on the Pat Patrick team, and he said, indeed, they have made some adjustments in the rear of the car, specifically with the clutch and also with the ring and pinion. I asked him what they were, and he said, those are Mo Nunn's, my secrets. Now, also, checking on that blister, Bobby Unser, it was a very small blister. It was only about the size of this hole right here. So it was an eagle-eyed crew member that noticed it. Remember, they didn't change tires the last stop, so it's not unusual, especially with the ambient temperature out here, as hot as it is. Let's check in further up pit road and Brian Hammonds. Brian? During Michael Andretti's last pit stop, he changed from the soft compound tire that he'd been playing with all race long by changing the air pressure. What he, he finally went away from that. He didn't like that setup. He went to the hard compound tire. The crew asked him if he wanted any wing changes. He said, don't do it. This car, this car is perfect. So Michael Andretti loves the way his race car is handling right now. Paul? All right, Brian, on the course, car 15, Jim Crawford, the Buick power, the man who had such a gorgeous run here last year. 
the car that was damaged severely, sent to England, brought back to the United States just Wednesday evening, completely reassembled after its bodywork, totally repaired, now comes to the side of the race course. Was running in fourth, but the engine is silent for the moment. Still out in front at the Indianapolis 500 with 139 laps complete is Michael Andretti. And we have an indication that Emerson Fittipaldi, the second place car, is heading for the pits once again. He stopped on lap 112, again on lap 129. This is the 139th lap as both Michael and Emerson it's, Fittipaldi roll in. It's under yellow. That's why there's been an incident and both Andretti and Fittipaldi are capitalizing on the yellow flag situation. You see Emerson there in the pits. His pit down at the south end, just beyond the entrance to Gasoline Yay! Alley. And now it's a race in the pits as Emerson Fittipaldi comes out and right behind him, there is Michael Andretti. So in the pits, there is where the crews can be so critical. Proper placement of the pit position and fast work by the Patrick team and Emerson Fittipaldi is back in front. So Michael Andretti now rides in second place. Just that quickly, positions change at the Indianapolis 500 mile race. We're under yellow once again. No indication for the yellow, certainly no accident, so it must be debris that was noted by one of the many USAC observers here on the race course. Michael Andretti rides, tries to think what can he do now to get back around Emerson Fittipaldi. That was a very, some people might be wondering why Emerald came in so quick. Well, it was a very fast pit stop, but he was just there before. And what the pit crews do is they try to figure out the sequences so they'll be at the proper place at the end of the race. The grandstand and the blimp up behind us under the yellow flag once again in Indianapolis. We'll be back right after this. We're back live at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. We've just seen some great pit stops. Of course, that's the key to changing positions at the Indianapolis 500 when the driver can't get it done. The Patrick team just got it done for Emerson Fittipaldi. Earlier in the week, there was a pit stop competition held here. In a business where success is measured by speed and split second timing, IndyCar pit crews serve quietly as the sport's hidden heroes. Their efforts may sometimes be obscured by the excitement of Victory Lane, but their skills are showcased here annually in the running of the $50,000 Miller Indy Pit Stop Championship. This year's first semifinal pitted Al Unser Sr. driving a Penske backup car against his son Al Jr. The contest rewards the team that completes a simulated pit stop in the shortest period of time, and little Al's crew did just that to move to the finals. In the second semi, Mario Andretti in the right lane faced off against Emerson Fittipaldi. The Andretti team, led by Colin Duff, was the winner with a stop of 13.649 seconds. This set up an Unser Andretti finale with both crews confident of victory. Little Al's crew got to go to work first when their driver hit the stop marks. As the Andretti team then went to work, Unser's crew used split second timing to finish their tasks. Mario's crew, meanwhile, faltered with problems tightening the left rear wheel. Sensing that the wind was within grasp, Junior smokes the tires and crosses the timing lights with a clocking of 14.716 seconds. For Team Gallus, led by Owen Snyder and crew members Paul Marcus, Shea Campbell, Kyle Moyer, Mike Arnold, and Gary Armentrout, it was a moment to truly enjoy. For them, today was a day to step out of their roles as hidden heroes and enjoy the applause and rewards that true champions deserve. $25,000, that's, that's better than a lot of races pay for winning. The view down on the two and a half miles of the Indianapolis Motor Speedway from the Goodyear Airship America, based out in Houston, Texas. Don McDuff, the captain on board today, helping give you some of the beautiful coverage shots of the Indianapolis 500 and some action shots as well. Giant crowd here, nearly half a million people. Emerson Fittipaldi circulates around, completing the 144th lap under yellow in the lead. We'll be back with more from Indianapolis. Back live at the Indianapolis 500 mile race, still under yellow, Emerson Fittipaldi leads, 145 laps complete. Next Saturday on ABC Sports, the high rollers of the professional Bowlers Spring Tour will be in Las Vegas, Nevada for the Showboat PBA Doubles Classic. Now, bowlers there will team up for big money 
It's the final stop of the spring tour, and the action starts Saturday on ABC Sports. And then it's wide world of sports. You'll see a unique combination of gymnastics and figure skating. It's the very first time accomplished athletes like Brian Batano, Bart Connor, Robin Cousins, and more display their skills in the Caress Symphony of Sports. A truly special event next Saturday on ABC's Wide World of Sports. And the field still behind the pace car, working their way around the track while the USAC officials and safety crews try and scrub the track clean of any oil that may have been laid down in the last few minutes. Let's go down to the second row. With Teresa Fittipaldi, whose husband is leading this event today. And Teresa, you said just before we went on the air, I think today is Emerson's day. I think so. He deserves. He's really excited. Now, every time he comes by, you've rested here on your perch. And haven't moved at all. And when he goes by, you take your hand and you just go like that. What's that about? It means energy, positive, you know, giving some energy. Now, there's another story that every time Emerson comes into the pits, you whisper something to him, although you're 15 feet away from him. What is that? <laughs> means energy. means good luck. Good luck, and they certainly hope they have plenty of it, at least enough to last for this race, Paul Page. Now, let's check in with Brian Hammonds, who is with Carl Haas. And Carl Haas is sitting on the scoring stand, charting the race for his drivers, Mario and Michael Andretti. Carl, you've got to be happy with where you're sitting with Michael. Well... <laughs> Yeah, we, we had some problems with Mario, which is not too good. Michael's not sitting in a bad spot. He's obviously Fittipaldi's able to run a little quicker, but I think we still have a fighting chance with a little bit of a luck. Hope we can hold in there and get a chance at it at the end. Michael happy with the way the car's running? Well, I guess he's fairly happy with the way it is. I'd like a little more speed, but it's okay. Well, Haas, right now his driver's sitting in second place. Now let's go to Jerry Punch. Well, gentlemen, an anxious wife waiting here in the Allenser Jr. pits. That's Shelly Unser. And Shelly, you've seen this act so many times. And how will the scene finish? I know Little Al has won on, on road courses and street courses, but he's yet to get that first oval track win. I know, can you wait for the final 55 laps? Oh, I, so I wish I knew the answer. Um, at least we got our lap back. We're now on the same lap as the leaders. So we'll just have to wait and see what happens. You some, Rick? You're talking uh, on the radio with Rick Gallus, the owner here, and the rest of the crew. Do you think Little Al has something left he can handle, M.O.? I don't know, Emma's running awfully quick. You just never know at this race what's gonna happen. And you know, there's so many things that enter into it, fuel and tires, and I'm just back here keeping a lap chart, so I wouldn't be able to be able to tell you any of that. <laughs> Shelly Unser, her heart pounding, watching husband, little Al Unser. Well, when they come back, Al Unser Jr. has 10 cars between him and the second place car of Michael Andretti. We'll be back with more coverage of the Indy 500 after this message and a word from our ABC stations. We're back live at the Indianapolis 500. The green light just winked on once again, and Emerson Fittipaldi has jumped out in front again. Now, that, that white debris that you see spraying about the track is part of the reason for the very long yellow. It's not a problem on Emmo's car, but it is some oil dry laid on the race course to pull the oil off the circuit and make it safe to race. It certainly is, Paul, and everybody wonders, is it slippery or is it easy to get a hold of? It is definitely slippery. On board slip second place, Michael Andretti. But it's not nearly as slippery as the oil itself is. It's the lesser of the two evils, but the guys will avoid it, the drivers, as much as they can. Michael Andretti, now that white oil dry is coming off of the second turn. Let's just watch as he rolls through it, Bob. Okay, he's coming out of turn one, going in. There's the oil dry starting there. He knows how Michael went in extra low to avoid it. He's wanting the slower car to clean it all off so he doesn't have to run it. 150 laps are complete. Just 50 to go now. 125 miles of the Indianapolis 500 left to be tested here on the Brickyard, the two and a half mile speedway. Al Unser Jr., he runs in third place. He is six seconds behind the leader. He had 10 cars between this machine and that of Michael Andretti. He's trying to catch up that distance now. Well, got traffic, Paul. He's quite a ways back in the pack. You notice all the cars that he's going by, and that's really hurting him a little bit because Emerson Fittipaldi, right there on the screen, is in clean air. He has no traffic. He's setting sail hard right now. And you'll notice when you see the onboard pictures of Little Al's car that he has a, a liquid crystal display on the dash in front of him. The drivers here at the 500 for the very first time 
actually have a speedometer. He can look down and know exactly how fast he's going. In the past, they've had only tachometers, which give him a relative idea of speed, but now there you, you can see that's his, his tachometer, which is a graph now on the car that shows exactly how fast the engine is turning. That's part of a system, Paul, that gives you complete information on anything they want to know about this car. It's the new computer age that we live in. Well, in fact, here we have a schematic of the uh, dashboard of the Lola car, which uh, Michael Andretti is driving. It has a sort of Star Wars look to it. The key is that it's computerized, got digital readouts rather than conventional analog instruments. Pretty neat looking stuff. Sam, and they really don't look at those either. What they do is try to glance at them when they come off the turn. What they're doing down the straightaway to the end of the straightaway is the not important at all to the drivers. Bobby, have you determined is there a preference for this or the old analog dial system where they used to point the dials so that when everything was pointed straight up, everything was perfect? Which do the drivers seem to prefer? Oh, uh, they would all like the hand, Paul, but they can't get away from it from the new computer technology. That instrument tells them so much, like what their fuel mileage is, how much they have left. It's a complete computerized system for the car. Michael Andretti now closing down on the leader, Emerson Fittipaldi, and gets past. So Michael Andretti picks up the lead of the Indianapolis 500. Emerson seemed to falter for just a second and slowed down just a bit. So now here is Michael coming to the line, scored in the lead once again. He just turned the last lap at 215 miles an hour and has picked up the lead, and you can see that Emmo seems to be falling a bit behind. Well, he certainly is, and there's got to be some reason for it. It's going to show up before too long. Now, I'm not saying Michael's not going fast. He's been one of the best handlers all day, handling through the turns, but he's been a little bit shy on speed compared to Emerson Fittipaldi. Now, if he wanted to wake Emmo up, he's done it already. We'll have to see. Michael Andretti overhauls the leader, Emerson Fittipaldi. Again, the battle is at the front of this 500-mile race field. Most of the top 20 are not truly in contest with one another. We'll keep our eyes open for battles back through the pack. Let's go back here a couple of laps and take a look at Michael Andretti as he closed on the leader, Emerson Fittipaldi. Here they come, Bobby Unzer. It's most likely that Emmo, remember, he just got new tires a little while back. It's most likely that he's got his stagger just a little bit wrong, not handling quite as good. Or maybe Michael got his stagger good, and he's working better than he was earlier. Michael Andretti, here's the onboard camera view of the same situation a couple of laps ago as Michael just came inside of Emerson Fittipaldi and right on down into the turn and out in front. Let's go to the pits and Jack. Bobby Unser, you're absolutely right as far as the stagger situation on the race car of Emerson Fittipaldi. He's developed a slight push, the first he's had all day. So he's had to back out of the throttle just a tad, and that accounts for the pass by Michael Andretti. These cars are so finely tuned, Jack and Paul, that there's, when they get the stagger off just a little tiny bit, there's nothing you can do about it in the stagger. Now, what's happening is they're turning 216 and 217 miles an hour in laps, and that again is awesomely fast. Remember, back at the start of this race, we talked about these kind of terms, showed you definitions. Stagger means that the right rear tire is slightly larger and just minutely larger than the left rear. Now, Goodyear provided two staggers here at the track, but they can still augment that slightly by putting a little more air in the tire and trying to get it to grow just a little bit more. Stagger helps the car turn into the corner, but if they have too much stagger, then the car turns in a little too fast, and then it becomes loose. Another definition that we had earlier, which is to say the back end wants to swing out and all the way around. Absolutely right, Paul. It's a good explanation, and there is approximately one inch difference. And then yet, with these kind of speeds, that's the world. That's a big thing. The key question, of course, is what is going on in Emerson Fittipaldi's mind? And I think what you have to understand is he can't try any harder than he's trying now. A driver can only do so much in these cars. And when you have that push condition, you just have to ride it out to the next pit stop. Very frustrating for him. He's got to desperately gamble that the yellow is going to come out or he's going to lose enough ground that it could be decisive in this race. We were talking earlier, too, about the uh, PC-18s and the fact that three of them are already out and do the design problems that may exist on some exist on others. You must remember that it was the Patrick Racing Team that first identified the possibility of a real rear colling coming off, as happened with Danny Sullivan. 
they changed the fasteners to avoid it. Apparently, they've also noticed some other situations and made improvements on those as well. So at the Indianapolis 500, we watch them give the board to Emerson Fittipaldi. 216 mile an hour left. Not up to his 218 he's run earlier. Not far off. So Emerson Fittipaldi still is chasing Michael Andretti at the Indianapolis 500 as they seesaw back and forth in the lead. We'll be back with more at the Indy 500, the 73rd running after this. We're back at the Indianapolis 500. Michael Andretti running in the lead. Just like his father several years ago, the engine has let go. He coasts to a stop on the track from the lead. Michael Andretti out of the 500. That's another Chevrolet problem with those engines today, Paul. And you can watch as the smoke comes out of the tailpipe. That's when you know it's coming out water and oil. That means they really got the engine good. We talk about what fathers as here comes Emerson Fittipaldi streaking into the pits and we're gonna have to watch and see what he does. Although it is no longer that critical, is it? Because he has a big lead now and his main rival is Al Unser Jr. Sam, which will in turn cause the yellow to come out, which will in turn give little Al a chance to catch back up and it'll still put two cars right together for the lead. The yes, Patrick indeed. crew carefully taking their time. Look at this as the steam from that engine wafts over the front of Michael's car, and look at him, he pounds the steering wheel in frustration as Emerson Fittipaldi comes out in just a few seconds. He will come past Michael Andretti. Safety crews with Michael. We talk about what sons inherit from their father, what skills and what attitude. How about what kinds of luck? He Michael really Andretti going out in Indianapolis way his dad has so often here before. Look at the stare in Michael's eyes, the disappointment. The Indianapolis 500 could have been his. He has a right to be sad, Paul. The rope is to help them tow the car back into the pit areas. Strange how much his eyes, which looked so youthful just last week compared to Mario's, that sort of already just in today's proceedings taken on that extra wisdom that goes with him such severe disappointment as this. Fans wish so much for the Andretti family. And once again, it has come to this. This time, though, it strikes Michael. So many people want to see Michael score his first Indianapolis 500-mile race win. They thought perhaps this was the day. Now, with Emerson Fittipaldi's Pit pit stop, that brought Al Unser Jr. up to the front of the field. And under the yellow, little Al will be scored in the front of the race. A little Al has yet to make his pot pit stop, and there's Michael on the on the rope on the way into the pits, and his day is done. Now it was over on the front straightaway that this situation first developed. Car was looking so good and so fast. There's his car moving down the main stretch. Look about halfway down there, right at the line now. The engine let go right in front of the giant grandstands that line the. Five eighths of a mile long home stretch at the speedway, and he coasted to a stop over on the back stretch. Now the crowd salutes him as he comes back. on fuel, 11.3 seconds, no tire change, just fuel only. Let me see if I can get a quick comment from Rick Gallus on whether they can make it the rest of the way. Rick is here charting. Rick, can you go the rest of the way on fuel? Can you make it the rest of the way on fuel? What's that? 
Can you make it the rest of the way on fuel, Rick? We have to wait and see. <laughs> a big smile from Carl to Rick Gallus. They were rolling the dice, trying to decide when to bring him in. They said, wait, wait one more lap. No, wait two more laps. They're hoping for some yellow flag laps, but I believe they think they can make it. Paul? Well, Bobby, they stopped on 165 laps. 200 laps is the distance. We're now within 100 miles of the end of the Indianapolis 500. You think they're going to go the distance? Paul, it's going to make a heck of a story at the end because it's going to be close. We're just in one of those real nice little fairy tale stories. Little Al, it's going to be very close, but he's not the only one. Emma is also going to be close. Now let's just see if perchance they stay yellow for a few more laps, Emma may decide to duck in and get a last shot, but they're not going to. They're heading for the green. Green flag comes out once again. This time it will be Little Al, Al Unser Jr., who is the, the leader of the race itself as they come across the line. Emmo now picks up the lead as a result of that stop, and Emmo leads the field in through the first and second turn. Little Al is now six seconds back. And a lot of cars have to be passed before he can really take up the attack. Of course, Little Al, first race at Indy in 1983. His best finish to date has been four. Remember, Sam, we're getting back down to the fuel deal like we see in so many races. Little Al, will he use less fuel than Emmo? Emmo's out in clean air. In, in real life, Little Al should be able to gain a little bit in mileage because of the traffic, whereas Emmo is going to be on the gas all the time because he's really in the clean air. Emerson Fittipaldi keeps the pace down as Michael Andretti walks through the back of the pit area back to his garage. His day is done. 167 laps now complete. 211.2 miles an hour. The speed, Emerson Fittipaldi turned that last lap. Now the question, of course, is fuel. There's 40 gallons of fuel in each of these race cars when they are full. That takes them a distance that Bobby, by my calculations, brings them right up against lap 200. What do you think? Well, I think they're really going to be up against it. Little Al's going to be just a tick better than Emma is on that bar, ball, but not very much. And ironically, they're both, if they decide to go this way, they're both going to have to ease up on the gas. Now, Emma could, on the other hand, just go like a house on fire come in and try to get a splash on fuel. All right, let's get an update now from Jack Aruch. Well, first of all, if you look at Emerson Fittipaldi's fuel tank, there's about 60 gallons left, plenty of fuel to go the distance. We checked with the team and the brain trust here has said, we are going to come in for a time stop, somewhere around 12 to 10 laps to go in this event. That's their planning right now. But for so many times we've seen here in the Indy 500, those plans can go awry by way of a caution or something that happens on the racetrack. Back and to you. That harkens back to 1982 when the Patrick Racing Team did exactly the same thing for Gordon Johncock. That's they right. knew how many gallons he needed to get to the end of the race. They calculated the fuel flow in the hose. They decided they needed only so many seconds. I think it was seven or eight. And as soon as they hit seven seconds, somebody reached out with a pole, tapped the refueler on his helmet. He pulled the hoses free. Gordon Johncock in a tight battle with Rick Mears, won by 14 one hundredths of a second. You know, Paul, even in, in this race today, you won't even need that much time because all they need, either one of them, is probably a measly little three gallons of alcohol, and they could be the winner from it. So Emerson Fittipaldi is running laps faster than Al Unser Jr. Fittipaldi is out in front running at 214. Ten seconds back is little Al running laps at 213. This Indy 500 is not over yet. We'll be back. We're back at the Indianapolis 500, and there is the car of Michael Andretti in the pit, silent. His day is done. Let's go to Brian Hammonds. Michael Andretti and his wife, Sandy. Michael, what was it that ended your day? Well, the engine blew. At any point, you were running so well. At any point during this race, were you thinking to yourself that my dad won this thing 20 years ago, and here I am leading Indy? Yeah, and... Uh, I guess I inherited more than uh, just his driving. I think I l inherited a bit of his luck here at this place because, uh, you know, the car was just so good. I was just taking my time, um, you know, a nice conservative pace, not trying to take anything out of it. But uh, obviously, I guess we took too much out of it. I don't know where. For a while today, Michael Andretti really had him covered. Paul? A good driver, a likable man, out of the 500-mile race. In the pits, here is Raul Boisel. He is the third-place car, but he is five laps behind the leader. The only two cars in contact on the course are Emerson Fittipaldi and Al Unser Jr. 
The fourth place car is Mario Andretti, but he is six laps behind the leader. The Boisel, using one of the Judd engines, continues to be in the hunt and makes his stop to 1.2 seconds. Boisel works his way back into the traffic. And here is the 22 car, and he has a problem. Now, he was running in, uh, in fourth place before he came in for this pit stop. But now, obviously, a bit of a problem on that car. A lengthy stop, but they get it fired up once again. And there goes Scott Brayton back into the action as well. But the distances between the third-place car of Boisel and the fourth-place car here of Brayton and the others is so great that they can afford a few seconds here and there. It's really the leaders who can afford nothing. Uh, every split second counts between Emerson Fittipaldi and Al Hunter Jr. There is the leader, Emerson Fittipaldi, 177 laps complete. He slowed down yet another mile an hour, running 212 and a half now. Let's go to the pits and Jerry Punch. Well, it's nail biting time here in the Allenser Jr. pits. They have been doing a lot of calculating here on the fuel mileage, and Rick Gallus, 35 laps, 87 and a half miles. Can you make it the rest of the way? We're going to see. <laughs> we're going to see. You got him backing off a little bit to maybe conserve some fuel? He didn't back off to anybody. I mean, we're trying as hard as we can, and we're five laps up on third place. So we're going for it. I mean, you only get a chance to win this sucker once, and we're going to do the best we can. I think that puts it in perspective, fellas. They really want to win here at Indy. Allister Jr. thinks they can go all the way. Rick Gallus, boy, is that aggression or what? I think that's nice. You can tell Rick Gallus is a true racer. It's taking him a while, but I guarantee you, that is the competitive spirit, don't you think, Sam? One chance to win this sucker. I like that. Yeah, absolutely. Go that's for terrific. it. You know, seven Chevrolet uh, engine car combination started this race. Only two are left, and they are placed one and two. Mario, fourth place car into the pits. Routine service as well. This is the 100 and 78th lap of the Indianapolis 500. Mario should be able to go all the way to the end with his fuel. He should have no problem. Mario Andretti powers up back into the action. No problem on that car. Only Michael had that machine. Perhaps he would still be contesting Emerson Fittipaldi for victory at the Indianapolis 500 mile race. Fittipaldi still runs in front. There's A.J. Boyd. Nope, it's not. That's Rocky Moran's car. Jay Foyt just behind. There he is, the number 14 car, right behind his team car of Rocky Moran and Mario right there. A.J. Foyt, his 32nd race, runs in fifth place on this track. The yeah. first four-time winner of the Indianapolis 500-mile race. So now we go into the closing laps of the 73rd running of the Indy 500. 20 more to go now. Emerson Fittipaldi is the leader. Al Hunter Jr. is chasing him. We're back live at the Indianapolis 500. A wheel rolling loose, coming off of the fourth turn on the main stretch. It belonged to Terrell Pomroth's car. The crew out there got it stopped before it went back into the lane of traffic. We are under yellow. Bringing out the yellow is going to be a big factor. Another change in strategies. Now, Emmo's into the pit to get his flash. Now we're going to have to see what little Al's going to do. He won't have enough fuel to run real hard to go to the end, Paul, that's for sure. Well, Emerson Fittipaldi comes down under this yellow flag to make a pit stop. He sits in the pit, Al Unser Jr. working his way still around the course. It appears certain that Fittipaldi will complete his pit stop and come out into the action before little Al comes by. Little Al, as Emerson Fittipaldi chugs away a little bit, Fittipaldi was having some problems getting away, now, it may be that Little Al will catch him down in the first turn. Fittipaldi gets caught up behind a safety vehicle. And look how close they come out together. Fittipaldi is just one car ahead, down there to the inside. And Little Al sees him and knows that he's got to stay in contact with him. Bobby, it could be a very close call on rules here, though, couldn't it? Yes, it could be. Now, what would, it, what would have been happening before? Little Al would have had his lead down as much as he could go because he was going to the end. Now everything has changed because Emmo does have fuel. Emmo could have his boost up, low gear to race in. He could go for it all the way. Little Al is going to have to go conservative and he can do nothing about it. Under yellow, Al Unser Jr. You saw Chili Unser in the pit talking with other members of the crew. That's the tactics now. We're within 18 laps of the finish of the Indianapolis 500. We go back to the situation that causes yellow. 
Carol Pomeroff, you see him there now, only with three wheels. The Finnish driver, a true gentleman, makes no bones about the fact that he bought his ride. Incidentally, it was his birthday today. He's 36. Some mechanic's gonna be in trouble for that one, Sam. It looks like they probably left the tire loose. Lucky it didn't hit another car, another car hit it, rather. Taro Pomwas, the wheel comes off, he is able to turn down into the pit area without any other more serious consequences. He controls it very nicely. To salute him in Finnish, I would say Sepahauska. Taro, that means very good. All right, Emerson Fittipaldi with uh, little Al hand up in the air on the back stretch, riding in second place. He's lined up right behind Emmo on the racetrack. It should be a sprint to the finish. We're back live at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway in our sixth caution period of the day. Let's go to the pits. Here is Brian Hammond. Paul, this yellow flag is really helping Al Enzer Jr. At these low speeds, he's able to conserve fuel. Rick Gallus, the team owner, says we have plenty of fuel now. We're going racing toward the finish. Back to you. Well, Bobby, what about the tactics of that? Is that what you would have done? Well, Paul, I think I would have spliced him on just a little bit, let him turn everything up, turn a lower gear, and just let that thing go all the way because we already know that Emmo has enough fuel to make it. If he doesn't break, he's going to be really tough. And little Al's got his work cut out for him now. Little Al, second place. Emerson Fittipaldi, the 20 car, just ahead. There they are, lined up behind the pace car. The fuel gets about double mileage. You figure a pace car, or excuse me, a yellow flag lap, Paul, to be about uh, twice the mileage that you get under the green. They're running in like second or third gear, not really getting super good mileage, but about double what they normally get. You know, we've mentioned the third place where old boy Sell is five laps behind the leader. Now, if that is, uh, that's a situation for him, the way they've played this race serves Boisel's advantage because they're gonna flag the race at 200 laps. So any of the cars that are running well behind the leaders can jo go just as fast as they wanna go now, can't they? Absolutely right. But I think that most of those cars back there, like for example, Boisel, who's run good all day, I think he's going flat out anyway. But you're right, he just doesn't have to get the mileage that the leaders do. Well, Scotty Brayton, sixth place right now. Last four and five hundreds. 30th or worse, so it's a pretty good day for him no matter how he looks at it. And Scott Pruitt, who uh, started 17th, is up now into 8th place. So let's take a look at the situation with regard to Little Al. He's never won on an oval. He certainly never won the Indianapolis 500. Emerson Fittipaldi, two-time world champion, has not won at Indianapolis either. In fact, there are only two men in the top 10 who have completed this race in first place. That's Mario Andretti and A.J. Foyt. As Teresa watches Emerson Fittipaldi stream away through the short shoots, the south end of the track, through the second turn now, and Little Al is in pursuit. Well, this is gonna be the contest, the real show, because it's a Lola against a Pinsky built PCA team of Emerson Fittipaldi's. And can Little Al not only stay with him, but be able to pass him? Well, Shelly Unser watches as well as Little Al has Royal Boisel, the third place car, five laps behind the leader separating him. And there was, a, there was a flash of something at the back of the car there for a second. Well, that's water. That's water either coming from Boisel's car or Little no, Little it's Bosell. No, I think it's from Bosell's car. Uh, you can see it Bobby. screaming off the back of the car. That could indicate that that engine is about ready to let go. Well, whatever it is, it's going to cause Little Al to lose some ground there. And Bosell, incidentally, who drives sports cars uh, part of the time, is a very aggressive driver. He's a terrific guy, but he's an aggressive driver and not easy to pass. But well, Bobby Unzer, if you have that indication, would you want to tuck in too close to the back of that 30 car? Yes, as long as it's spraying like that, he'll run offline a little bit, Paul. He has no choice. He just can't let the race go from here. He's running very conservatively blind. He's just, it's a question about will both sales car keep running, losing yeah, that But what if foot. the engine would let go and spray oil back there? Little Al would instantly be into it. Right well, there, it's already happened. Both sales had engine problems, little Al got by. Look at the smoke coming out of both sales car right now, or at least the fluid. The Shearson entry of Raul Boisel running in third place, but beginning to show problems. It gives an opportunity for Allinger Jr. to continue to move ahead. But it's holding it's hold it back a little bit, Paul. That's another little thing that's got against him right now. He's really got his job cut out with Emmo having a good clean track to run on. 
That's where luck has such an uh, impact on this 500 mile race. You just never know what's going to happen next out here. Sometimes you get out of bed on the right side, sometimes the wrong side. Shelly is really disappointed, as you can see. He is a terrific woman, and I think a great, great effect on uh, Al Unser Jr., who, of course, was tutored by his dad, Bobby, your brother, in racing, but I think in ways of dealing with the press and being the open, wonderful person that he is, Al Unser Jr., I think has been greatly affected by Shelly. Do you buy that assessment? Oh, she's been a very good girl, and you can just tell her by her actions in the pits. She really supports her husband an awful lot. She gets born in the race, and I think for most of us do. The leader, Emerson Fittipaldi, car number 20. Little Al is just 1.8 seconds back. And here comes Emerson Fittipaldi on the main stretch now, flashing by to complete the 190th lap. And look at her, just infuse energy, those fingers of energy going out to Fittipaldi. She's counting the laps. Did you see her say, go get them, and look up the scoreboard, counting the laps. Now, in history of the Indianapolis 500, at lap 190, the leader in nine previous occasions has not finished out in front. Most recent, of course, Kevin Kogan, with 10 laps to go, lost to Bobby Rahal, 1983. Al Unser led on 190 laps, but Tom Sneva won. If Emerson can win the race, he will follow in Mario Andretti's footsteps, of course, as a man who has won both the World Championship and the Indy 500, as well as Mario did it in the other order as you see the racer wish on that great energy to be noted that Emerson eats a very special diet of uh, root grains. He uh, gets plenty of aerobic exercise, so that energy really means something in that family. Now there's little Al right on the track, not up as close as he'd like to be. Pursuit. 191 laps complete. 1.6 seconds back. Little Al trying to close. Now a half a second back. 192 laps complete. 1982. Mears versus John Cox. All over again. The closest finish ever at the Indianapolis. of a second back to the home stretch again. Tension is incredible. says no, five laps to go. The back stretch, another try. Can Al Unser Jr. get it done this time? It's a drag race going into three and Little Al has the lead. Al Unser Jr. picks up the lead. The question now is fuel. Get the yellows. Help Little Al enough. 
Jr. Little Al wandered back and forth on the main stretch. Was he trying to pick up a little more fuel? That tank is right down to the bottom now with four laps to go. He's trying to break the slipstream that Emma's trying to use to keep up, Paul. AJ's first win on pavement. Will Ellinger Jr. score his first oval win here today? second back to the home stretch again. Tension is incredible. says no, five laps to go. The back stretch, another try. Can Al Unser Jr. get it done this time? It's a drag race going into three and little Al has the lead. Al Unser Jr. picks up the lead. The question now is fuel. Get the yellow. Help little Al enough. Little Al wandered back and forth on the main stretch. Was he trying to pick up a little more fuel? That tank is right down to the bottom now with four laps to go. He's trying to break the slipstream that Emma's trying to use to keep up, Paul. AJ's first win on pavement. Will Ellinger Jr. score his first oval win here today? Inside little Al. 
A drag race on the backside again. Slower traffic moves to the right. Can Fittipaldi get past? Little Al brings it down low. They touch. Little Al into the wall. Fittipaldi continues on. Little Al slams the wall as Emerson Fittipaldi screams toward the white flag. The yellow flag comes out. Al Unser Jr. taps with Emerson Fittipaldi. They are on the main stretch now, but it's Fittipaldi's car fit. Fittipaldi tried it inside the third turn. The white flag is out. 199 laps are complete. The yellow flag flies. Teresa kisses Pat Patrick. Can you imagine the despair that Shelley and Al Unser feel now? Because for the second year in a row, he's okay. Little Al climbs out of his car, walks away from the safety crews. For the second year in a row, the Indianapolis 500 will finish under the yellow flag, but this time it will be a new name. It will be that of two-time world driving champion Emerson Fittipaldi. Former world driving champions winning here. Jimmy Clark, Graham Hill, Mario Andretti, and now the name Fittipaldi will go into the books. What promised to be a close finish ended with a lap and a half to go. Allinger Jr. stands by the edge of the race course. What will be his reaction as Emerson comes by? Was he angry? Did he gesture? He went out to signal him. Little Al stepped out toward the edge of the track. Now the pace car will lead Emerson Fittipaldi, just like it did last year for Rick Mears, toward the checkered flag. The 73rd Indianapolis 500 is rolling to an end, and Emerson Fittipaldi, under the yellow flag, has captured his first 500-mile race victory at Indianapolis. Emerson Fittipaldi wins the great race. And boy, are they happy. No surprise whatsoever. into the ambulance, but it was obvious he was not hurt in the crash, despite a very hard impact with the wall. The Patrick Racing Team begins now their celebration, and Emerson Fittipaldi waves to the crowd on the backstretch for the first time as the winner of an Indianapolis 500-mile race. Look at Emo. He's really happy, Paul. We didn't get the chance to see exactly what happened. That in-car cam really showed the jolt that Little Al got going into the turn. Here we go, Bobby Unger, on the back stretch as Little Al and Emo race closely together. One view of the situation. It just appears that Emo drifted out, got Little Al's left rear with his right front. Little Al couldn't do anything about it. That was very similar to an accident we saw in a stock car race two weeks ago. So Emerson Fittipaldi with an accident here. Let's take a look at it again. Fittipaldi darted away from Little Al, tried to get inside him. The two cars are neck and neck into the corner. Traffic just ahead. They touched wheels. Little Al went sliding into the wall. Fittipaldi was able to maintain control. He pulled a similar feat at at uh, Toronto okay, just a couple of years ago. Okay. The last lap spin and was able to continue on. He's done it again this time. It's paid off in an Indianapolis 500 mile race win. It takes such a small bump to throw a car totally out of control. Let's take a look on board little Al's car. The same situation when we have an opportunity. We watch Emerson Fittipaldi hold on to the checker. The winner of the Indianapolis 500. Now we go down to victory lane, Jackaroo. Well, Paul, it is an incredible victory lane here. Emerson Fittipaldi has brought his car here on the stage. We are going up in the air right now. They are trying to, trying to, trying to move the car here just a little bit forward as they are trying to get Fittipaldi unbuckled from all the gear that he carries. Now he's coming up out of the car, and of course, a little bit of controversy there when the yellow light came out. We'll talk to him about that as well. Emo, you've done it. He's taking the, the congratulations. He's just leaning back. Pat Patrick is in here. Pat, 
Pat, congratulations. Thank you very much, Jack. We were sweating, as you know. Well, a co-owner now, Chip Ganassi, your first time in Victory Lane as well. Pretty exciting, Jack. Emerson did a world-class driving job. You did a hell of a job. World-class. You really did. I've never seen him take so long to get his helmet off, though. I think he's trying to gather in his composure. Emerson, getting finally the tearful kiss of his wife, Teresa. Emerson. Pure bedlam here. Good car, Pat. It's a beautiful car. Sex for the team. Oh, what a race. What a race. Emerson, you're an Indy 500 champion in 1989. Oh, I cannot believe, you know, as the team made a great work, you know, everybody, Morris Nunn, Pat Patrick, Jim McGee, I want to, work, to thank all the boys, and it was an incredible race. What about the contact between you and Al Jr.? What happened back there? I was going inside of uh, turn three on his inside because of traffic, and uh, he tried to come onto the inside with touch wheels, and I nearly spun off, I went sideways, and he lost it. You've won two World Driving Championships, but this is your first time to win at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway in what they call the greatest spectacle in racing. What are your thoughts right now? You know, Jack, as you cannot believe, you know, I dreamed so much since I was a little boy. Fantastic. Well, I think, Paul Page, that certainly tells you just how important this race is to you, Emerson Fittipaldi. It, it, it's just incredible that you ran so well all day, and then little Al closed up on you, and he was really concerned about fuel, and you weren't. Uh, his car was much faster on the straight, and luckily I got the traffic and done it. They want a moment to share. Eu quero mandar um abraço a todos os brasileiros aí. E para o automobilismo brasileiro, essa vitória. Obrigado. He just said his victory lane interview to the people in Brazil who are watching this live. So, Emerson Fittipaldi, second last year, first this year, wins the Indianapolis 500-mile race. There is much more to talk about, though. We'll be back with more coverage of the Indy 500 after this message and a word from our ABC stations. Back live at the Indianapolis 500. The 73rd running is now complete, and Emerson Fittipaldi is a new champion at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. The crowd, they stay standing, watching the ceremonies. Here's the onboard view from Al Unser Jr. as he came onto the backstretch. Now, Emerson Fittipaldi was maneuvering to the left. At this point, he was almost directly alongside of Little Al. Little Al looked over to see Fittipaldi there. He kept his foot down, went into the corner, turned in, stayed well above the line, but then was tapped by Fittipaldi, and he slammed into the wall. Fortunately, Allenser Jr. was not injured in this accident. In fact, he hopped out of the car almost immediately, and he can't believe his fortune here today. Fittipaldi was down below. Now, consider the ironic situation here that back at the Meadowlands just last year, these two were battling there, too, and they tapped one another. Only in that case, it was Fittipaldi who was out in front, Little Al went to the inside, they tapped, and it was Fittipaldi that came up the loser. Let's go to the pits, Brian Hammonds. And Rick Gallus can still manage a smile even after coming very close to winning the Indianapolis 500. Rick, your thoughts? Well, it was, uh, you know, I was quite a thrill leading it there at the end because we thought we had a chance to win it. But uh, I want to congratulate the Patrick team and Emerson. They did a fantastic job, and they hung in there all day, and they were fast, and we were trying to catch them all day. We did everything but, you know, throw a net out in front of them. So... I want to congratulate my crew, and uh, I want to thank Goodyear for those great tires they gave us. So, But, you know, I'm just happy Al's okay, and uh, I couldn't ask any more of a driver. I mean, he drove his heart out. Did you talk to little Al? Is he okay? I, t I talked to him on the radio, and he said he was fine, and, and uh, you know, he gave Emmo a thumbs up, and, and we're real proud of him. We, you know, we really weren't, we kind of hung on all day, and nobody's really talked about us this month. We knew we had a pretty good race car, so we, made, we just did the best job we could. All right. Back to you, Paul. Well, the results, unofficial for the moment. They'll be official tomorrow morning. But at the moment, it is Emerson Fittipaldi that shows as the winner of the Indianapolis 500. The despair that little Al feels. We'll be back.
We're back live in Indianapolis. The view from the Goodyear Airship America, stationed in Houston, Texas, as the giant crowd, for the most part, still decides that they're going to stay here. The blimp floats so lazily, so peacefully over the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. It's quiet now. The race has been run. Emerson Fittipaldi is the winner. But the situation developed in the closing laps of the race. Emerson Fittipaldi, the 20 car. Allinger Jr., the two car, heading into the third turn. Emmo went well below the line, fighting with Al. Now here they come. Here they come right out. Little Al is just gently ahead. Emmo is, oh, I'm sorry. Emmo's, Emmo's car, we're looking now to see if he actually maybe got onto the grass and that helped push him up. I don't think so, it's too wide for that. If you look at his wheel reference to the right or the white line. I think it was the extreme low line that Fittipaldi took that inevitably carried him out. I don't believe he He's touched the He's not getting grass. in the grass. Look how wide it is compared. Look at the white line of the right front tire of Emmo. That'll tell you, sir. Now, Al Alice is more or less Alice, staying parallel to the Alice white on, line. Al is on the line, I promise you. He's on the total racing line. Emmo has to come out. He can't stay down there. So little Al comes for a normal apex, taps wheels with Emerson Fittipaldi. I'd say it's incredibly lucky that little Al wasn't launched airborne and only slid up against the wall. He's at the hospital now, a cursory examination at the uh, track medical center. We are trying to get an interview with him just as soon as they release him. How many major car races are going to end this way? Confrontation between the two key men. So Emerson Fittipaldi now enjoys the fruits of victory at the Indianapolis 500. We'll be back with more. back at Indianapolis. We look at the 198th lap again, Bobby Unser. Here's where it starts getting touchy in the action. Little Al has got the racing groove. Emmo moves to the bottom under the white line. Now, he can't stay down there. It just is impossible for him to race that low all the way around. As they're coming off of number three turn, he's drifting out. Little Al is already in the line. It's one of these deals that you can't do anything but call a racing accident. Two cars cannot be in the same place at the same time. So it's just that simple. You're saying that it is nobody's fault. It really isn't anybody's fault the way I see it. It's just one of those things we call a racing accident. Emerson Fittipaldi having gone down that low just by the laws of physics had to be carried up high. Well, Emerson Fittipaldi continues his celebration at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway, the winner of the 73rd running of the Indianapolis 500. We'll be back with more coverage after this word from our local station. We're back at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. Pat Patrick, Emerson Fittipaldi and the team enjoy a victory with a ride on the pace car. Coming up next though on ABC Sports, round one of the International Race of Champions from Daytona. That series that pits in equally and matched cars, some of the finest drivers in racing. The IROC, right after their coverage of the Indianapolis 500. Now let's go to Jerry Punch. Paul, we're standing outside the Hanna Medical Center with Al Unser Sr. And uh, Al, you have you been inside to check on the Lau? How is he? Yeah, he's okay. Just his feelings are hurt. He's pretty unhappy right now. What happened? What did he say happened up there? Did he tell you? Well, he really didn't say. Uh, just what I saw in the film it looks like that Emil ran out of room and uh, didn't have anywhere to go. So they touched, and that's all it takes. The roller coaster of emotion for him and for you. I was sitting in the motorhome with you with two laps to go. You jumped on the bicycle and headed for Pitt Road, hoping to greet your son in victory lane, but it was not to be. Yeah, I thought he would uh, have it this time. <laughs> the four time Indy 500 winner, Alan Sir Sr., moves away from the infield care center, still waiting for his son, Alan Sir Jr., to come out. This was Shelly Unser when she realized what had happened to her husband that the Indianapolis 500 victory was not to be. Emerson Fittipaldi is the winner. We'll be back. Well, it's unofficial for the moment. It will remain so until 8.30 tomorrow morning when the official results will be posted, but it seems certain, no question, Emerson Fittipaldi has won the Indianapolis 500-mile race. We take a look at the unofficial results. Raul Boisel with his best IndyCar result to date. Mario Andretti in fourth. A.J. Foyt comes in and 
his last top five finish was 10 years ago. Brayton Jones, Vogler, Bernard Jourdain. We look down 11 through 15. Jones, Bukovic, Heimrath, Moran, Daly, Palmroth, Michael Andretti, Dominic Dobson, Jim Crawford, Didier Taze, Ari Leyendijk, Pancho Carter, Rick Mears, Al Unser, John Andretti. Bobby Rahal, Tom Sneva, Danny Sullivan, Randy Lewis, Dale Poppy, his 30th, Gordon Johncock, Kevin Kogan, Gary Bettenhouse, and the unofficial finish of the Indianapolis 500. We hope to talk to Al Unser Jr. in just a moment while Emerson Fittipaldi continues his celebration. Back at Indianapolis Raceway, Al Unser Jr. just coming out of the infield care center. First of all, Al, you hit a ton up there in turn, between turns three and four. Are you okay? Yeah, we're okay. I think uh, the car's okay, too. We didn't hit all that hard, but uh, we hit hard enough not to not to keep going. So, What actually happened up there? A lap and a half to go, and you and M.O. are battling for the lead. What happened? Well, basically what happened is uh, we came on lap traffic and uh, coming off at two, and that messed me up a little bit, and I couldn't get off the corner as well. And so that allowed M.O. to take a slingshot on me we got side by side there, and I was going underneath another a lap car on my right, and Emma was on my left. And uh, there, about halfway down, I started being able to pull Emma. And uh, so I went ahead and went in there, you know, ahead of him. And uh, and then since he was he was so tight on the corner, uh, he just he couldn't turn tight enough and and I was up as high as I could go to allow him room and anyway he hits me and I go spinning well we're on the tape of your car spinning up there Al could this have been avoided I don't think so I think uh, Emma wanted the race as bad as I did and when you got two race car drivers wanting the Indy 500 as bad as as we did at that point we're both going to go in the corner, and only one man's going to come out. And uh, this time it was uh, Emil that came out. Al, how big of a disappointment to come within a lap and a half of winning your first Indy 500? Well, it was it a <laughs> pretty big disappointment, you know, I, I think. Uh, but it's racing, and, and uh, the Indy 500 is, is our biggest race, but again, it is another race. And so... Uh, they're all disappointments when when stuff like this happens, and uh, you know, and that's the way it goes. So, there's a lot of energy burned by the driver, but a lot also by the wife. And Shelley, you were bouncing up and down on pit road, waiting for Al to come around that last time, and he didn't come. When did you hear about the crash? Uh, Rick, I saw Rick. I looked at Rick Gallus, and Rick Gallus, I could tell by him, and then I heard uh, Tom Carnegie say that he had crashed. And Big Al, your dad, had just come out of the motor home, jumped on a bicycle, and ran a qualifying lap through the garage area to get to your pit and try to be there when you took the checkered flag. But it was not to be. Not today. <laughs> not today Al, for the answer. Let's go back upstairs to Paul Pate. Well, Al Unser Jr. will still finish in second place at the Indianapolis 500. That, by the way, is, in fact, his best finish here. Coming up next, it'll be the International Race of Champions. The race has been safely run. Emerson Fittipaldi is the new champion, but already in the garage area, they begin to dream about the future, about next year, about the 74th running of the Indianapolis 500, one year away, May 27, 1990. 